Uh, so first of all, we want to welcome you to the first day of our three-day Women in French Postgraduate and Early Career Researcher Symposium entitled The Immersive Potential of Literature and Hybrid Media in the 20th and 21st Centuries. The symposium is of a profoundly collaborative nature and was created out of a desire to support postgraduate and early career researchers during the ongoing pandemic. It also represents a concerted effort to increase networking and intellectual exchange between WIF and its affiliate organizations in Australia and Europe. To that end, the symposium embodies a truly international endeavor. The organizing committee and presenters, which come from around the globe, our three keynote speakers similarly represent this ideal coming from institutions in the United States, England, and Australia. We'd like to recognize the generous support of Women in French and its affiliate organizations in making this online symposium possible. And to provide opening remarks, we'd like to introduce the president and vice president of WIF, Professor Arlene Cravens and Professor E. Nicole Meyer. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you to all of the organizers for organizing this truly international symposium. Uh, and in, it addresses the heart of what we strive for in women in French. And I'm thrilled uh, to open this symposium that explores not only the immersive potential of literature and its transformative capacity, uh, not only in sociopolitical uh, ways, but also interpersonal and personal experiences. In this way, the symposium interrogates the ways in which we uh, not only understand our identity in relationship to those around us, uh, but also within the context of the 21st century. And in this way, this conference expresses the inclusive foundation and mission of women in French. So I am very happy to welcome you. And again, many thanks to the truly international organizers and scope of this symposium. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, do you want me to start? So, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Uh, welcome. I am delighted to second the comments of Dr. Cravens with a heartfelt welcome to the International Women in French Organizing Committee of this wonderful event. Pooja Bullock, Francoise Campbell, Polly Gallus, Beth Kearney, and our Women in French graduate student representative, Eric Wistrom. The internationally renowned keynote speakers, Drs. Diana Holmes, Michelle Bachol, and Alexander Kerman are exceptionally talented and devoted WIFians. And I would like to personally thank them for supporting this conference and for all they do for women in French across the globe. The stellar talents of the aforementioned uh, committee and keynote speakers represent the best of an exceptional organization, Women in French. It has been a pleasure to work with you, these wonderful colleagues, to build Women in French, French's network and especially to support our graduate, postgraduate and early career researchers. Working with Eric in conjunction with creating a robust mentoring program, just under 80 mentors and mentees has been the most wonderful collaboration. In working together, we strengthen Women in French and indeed remind us all of what Women in French represents in the best possible way. I have enjoyed strengthening ties with WIF UK and appreciate their warm welcome at well their warm welcome at the General Assembly, and uh, indeed in all ways, it is wonderful to see the energy of women in French uh, Australia New Zealand with us. Their wonderful events supporting members at all levels. These international collaborations, represented so well by this marvelous conference the immersive potential of literature and hybrid media in the 20th and 21st centuries exemplifies both the present and future of our organization. Indeed, potential is so much a part of the spirit of women in French. The work that this conference represents comes during the most challenging time, a pandemic that refuses to end. Our members need these events, grants, dissertation and early career book awards to recognize their quality work their persistence despite all challenges, and yes, their potential. Women in French remain strong, believes in all of you. I myself look forward to continuing to support you, your creativity, your talents, and your dreams. Thank you. 
All right, so I have quarter after on my clock. Is this good for everyone to start with the first panel? All right, sounds perfect. All right, so good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending today's virtual panel entitled Immersive Multimedia. My name is Eric Wistrom, and I'll be your chair for panel one. We have two very exciting presentations today that are dedicated to building the conceptual framework of immersion, the first focusing on Exahaba's 2021 digital comic installation, Still Heroes, and the second on Sophie-Marie Lechoy's podcast, A Bientôt de Te Revoir. Today, I'll introduce each presenter and then turn the mic over to them so that they can present. I would ask that you hold your questions until the end of both presentations to ensure adequate time for discussion. Also, given the online platform today, I would additionally ask that everyone mute their microphone when not speaking to avoid any unnecessary distractions when our panelists are speaking. And lastly, since portions of the symposium are going to be recorded for archival purposes, I would ask that you turn off your camera if you don't wish to be recorded. So our first presenter today is Emma Rossby. Emma is a dual title PhD candidate in French and Francophone studies and visual studies at Pennsylvania State University. Her research focuses on how colonial histories are taught, learned, and mediated in the Belgian public sphere through the objects of graphic novels and the tools of visual storytelling. Emma is a current research fellow at the Belgian American Educational Foundation in Brussels, and her presentation today is entitled Still Heroes, Moving Parts, Interactivity Redefined in Exahaba's 2021 Digital Comic Installation. All right. All right, thank you very much, Emma, for that presentation. It was extremely interesting and thought-provoking. Um, and thank you very much, I really enjoyed that. Our next presenter is uh, Professor Andrea Johnson. Professor Johnson is an assistant professor of French at the Georgia Institute of Technology. She previously received a Bachelor of Music from McGill University and a PhD in French from the University of Pittsburgh. Her research traces connections between voice text and affect in popular culture, literature, music, and media. She focuses primarily on the way women's voices afford productive ways to rethink hegemonies of language. Andrea has several recent articles and chapters on humor, transgressive graphic narratives, popular music, and performance poetry. Her co-authored book with Heather Warren Crow is entitled Young Girls in Echo Land, hashtag theorizing tycoon and is forthcoming in 2021. Her presentation today is entitled Les Friandis et les Paroles Libres, The Unexpected Joy of Listening to Strangers Speak About Anything and Nothing in the podcast. A bientôt de te revoir. All right, Professor Johnson, when you're ready, please go ahead. I'm ready. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, and I, and I, I realize that I sent that in, but my book has now come out. So you can find it um, wherever you can find books. My co-authored book called uh, Young Girls in Echo Land, Theorizing Tikkun. Um, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Let me share my screen. Um, entire, I'm just going to do the entire screen. It's just going to be like that. Oh, no. Can I do that? How, how does that look? Oh, well, now mm. I can't see you. We can see Is your that screen okay? though. You can see my screen, can you see me? Um, in like the right side of the panel. Okay, like I can't see you, so if, if something goes wrong, um, talk to me because I won't be able to see gestures. So I have a very long title and I, I thought about tweaking it, but then I thought the, the person I'm talking about and the podcast I'm talking about, there is no, there's, uh, it's very wordy. It's all about uh, long stories. So um, I thought I'd leave it as, as this long title. Um, let's see. Okay. So um, podcasting, originally called audio blogging, first appearing in the early 2000s, is not exactly a new medium, especially when you consider the lightning speed of internet and gadget time. However, the growth of podcasts in France has taken off in recent years with studios such as Binge Audio, Nouvelles Écoutes, Qualité, and Louis Media that have a wide variety of podcasts that treat thematic content to targeted audiences. It is telling that Le Parisien's 10th of October 2020 headline read, Accro au podcast, plus de 5 millions de Français en écoutent chaque semaine, end quote. This number has steadily grown as people um, during the pandemic began listening more regularly, dopé par le confinement. 
There is very little scholarship written on podcasts from a cultural or gender studies perspective, and even less in a French studies context. This paper presents an excerpt of my research on amplified women's voices for my book in progress, uh, titled um, tentatively, Mike's Intimacy, Amplified French F Feminisms in Contemporary Pop Culture. In their article, Analyzing Digital Texts as Literary Artifacts, Lundström and Lundström call seeing podcasts as more than a text and more of an ethnographic field site. Vasquez sees podcasts as complex multimodal texts. Um, podcasting has a unique place in media history, especially for marginalized communities. Kim Fox and David O. Dowling call podcasts discursive cultural guides for listeners. Their focus on how podcasts have contributed to an articulation of Black identity and experience in media history because of the po possibility of reaching a wider range of audiences and online co communities. I maintain that the medium of podcasting is similarly uniquely suitable as a feminist platform because it connects digital communities while also relying on the intimacy of the human voice and storytelling for women who are marginalized or disregarded. There are an increasing number of French feminist podcasts with a wide variety of content, such as La Poudre, Quoi de Meuf, and Les Couilles sur la Table, that have recreated, recreated how women's interviews and conversations engage with key contemporary questions from gender to politics and popular culture. The creators, Lauren Bastide, Clémentine Gallo, and Victoire Tuaillon, have redefined women's journalism and have reclaimed soundscapes dominated by men. They renounce the imperative for unbiased, unemotional reporting, opting instead for an intimate conversation style that resembles the spontaneity of girl talk. In the vein of girl talk, I choose to focus today on a particular podcast, not because of its feminist contents, but because of its form and style that differentiates itself from the three previously mentioned podcasts. Through an analysis of the concept of frivolity, I present the beginnings of a case study of the podcast A Bientôt de Te Revoir, pr produced and hosted by Sophie-Marie Larouille. Sophie-Marie is a journalist, actor, YouTube star, comedian, writer, and host of previous shows for the online magazine Mademoiselle Les Mifions, and whose new sociological podcast On est chez nous is recording its second season currently for Binge Audio. In a recent Vendée blog portrait, the A Bientôt de Te Revoir podcast was described as, I quote, Discussion d'une heure en libre service, contre soirée dans la cuisine, road trip parfait d'improvisation, Sophie Marie y déploie tous les sujets possibles, tels les cartes d'autoroute XXL que l'on utilisait avant l'invention du GPS. Elle y tord le langage jusqu'à la poésie, cause du moindre détail anecdotique pour en extraire une sève merveilleuse, les riens quotidiens. End quote. If you have listened to A Bientôt de Reux, to voir, you might think of it as listening in on a frivolous conversation between friendly people who are pretending to be close friends. Yet there is a political consciousness to the frivolity as well. Alizé Pichot writes that Sophie Marie is, and I quote, féministe sans complexe, cette joueuse du langage et des idées se plaît à remettre en question des questions actuelles. Elle use des codes médiatiques délicieux à penser quand on en partageons les références, étonnant de bizarreries et d'imagination quand on ne les a pas. End quote. I employ a definition of form that relies on storytelling and seriality, but is also unscripted, spontaneous, and frivolous. The formal qualities of this podcast establishes an expansion of time. Uh, Sophie Marie Larouille, or I'll refer to her as SML sometimes, has a list of questions she pulls from depending on the directions the stories take. The way SML elicits unscripted stories recalls the way women have traditionally talked in shared domestic spaces while idle or working, which serve to afford a shared matriarchal cultural knowledge. Chit chat, gossip, and storytelling is the original analog broadcasting of feminism and still relies on the spontaneity of oral histories, the rhythms and cadences of speech, the way a story is strengthened by affect when retold. Caroline Levine writes that though forms, and I quote, contain and confine, end quote, there are also forms that can nest inside one another. Um, and that sometimes one form can collide with or disrupt another form's organizing power. She claims that, and I quote, the form that best captures the experience of colliding forms is narrative, end quote. The podcast is a form that houses narrative within episodes and also permits an extra episodic narrative in its serial form. In this way, it, affords, it affords, almost requires nesting forms. 
A podcast is not only a digital file, it is produced for an audience and relies on maintaining or gaining listeners. Its social platform does not rely on algorithms, but uses RSS-based functionalities or rich site summary or really simple syndication, a web syndication format that newsfeed aggregators and bloggers use. As Andrew J. Bottomley writes, and I quote, the use of RSS also implies seriality since the listener subscribes to a show that will repeat over time, providing new episodes on a semi-regular schedule, end quote. However, in contrast to the seriality of radio programming, the serial quality of podcasts aligns more with books or films in that though they are released on a certain date and often refer to current events or the social and cultural moment, listeners choose the temporality and locality of the diffusion, the episodes downloaded or played whenever and wherever is convenient. In this way, there are time bending media with an outsider status. As we have seen in the explosion of home podcast studios during the lockdowns and confinement of the pandemic, producing a podcast is accessible to amateurs and is a uniquely intimate medium, diffused widely but often listened to alone. Via headphones, we are connected to international networks of chosen conversations, generating an intermedial proximity to strangers. A Bientôt de Te Revoir is a playful, immersive podcast, one whose indefinability is its greatest asset. Sophie Marie does not interview her guests formally as a journalist might, but instead plays a friend, asking a series of questions that she says you would never hear in any other interview. Yel, who was a recent uh, guest, said she agreed to the interview because, and I quote, je sais qu'on est cool ici. Listeners return for her stylistic and humorous frivolity, her quick wit, and the way her interjections become private jokes shared by the growing podcast community. The title of the podcast itself is a private joke and refers to how her mommy leaves voicemails. In her early episodes, she hosted friends and fellow comedians, those she knew would provide a conversation worthy of public performance status, such as Patrick Baud, a whole, uh, host of his own podcast on strange and surprising historical and scientific trivia, and Marine Bausson, comedian and now host of her own podcast, Vulgaire. Let me begin by showing two videos of her early, earliest episodes. And you see the immersive quality that started right away from the beginning. Ah, bah, il s'appelle comme ça. C'est Broly, mais c'est Broccoli, quoi. Mais du coup, il, il a... Pourquoi il n'a pas... Il est, je sais pas, mais il est très, très puissant. Okay. Il s'appelle Broccoli. Il n'a pas le time euh, pour non. mettre... On continue Oui. <rire> Fleur de courge. Oh là là. Attends, à qui parle Ah oui, salut, Fleur de courge. <rire> Enchantée. <rire> Écoutez, merci pour cette, euh, cette expérience. Donc Bravo. maintenant, euh, Patoche, je te laisse... Ah, donc il s'appelle Vegeta. Euh, et et, et c'est là que tu vas être surprise, hein, parce que Sangoku, tu connais ce nom, tu, vois, tu l'as déjà entendu bien ouais. évidemment. Et le vrai nom de Sangoku, le, son nom original, comme Superman, c'est Kalel, c'est qu'il vient de la planète Krypton. Là, je, te, je, te, je te perds pas là. Il s'appelle Kalel. Euh... Kalel, le vrai nom de Superman sur la planète Krypton. Et puis quand il est arrivé sur Terre, ils l'ont appelé Clark Kent, mais euh, c'est à la base c'est Kalel. Et d'ailleurs, le fils de, de Nicolas Cage s'appelle Kalel aussi. Parce qu'il est fou, Nicolas Cage, il a appelé son fils comme Superman. Et donc, euh, je ça. Oui, la, fou, la, planète Vegeta, la planète Végéta, donc, ouais. les gens ont des noms de légumes. Et donc, le vrai nom de Son Goku, le vrai nom de Son Goku, c'est Carotte. C'est authentique. Non. Et en japonais, c'est Kakaroto. Carotte. Et il a un frère qui s'appelle Radi. Raditz. Mais non. Et il y a tout un délire comme ça de légumes. Parce que Akira Toriyama, l'auteur, c'est un gros euh, déconneur. Quoi. Et il aime délire. Il de, de légumes, quoi. Et ouais, ouais, sans doute. Putain, c'est un big délire. Attends, il y a un truc qui n'était pas prévu, mais est-ce qu'on a un, un micro pour, euh, pour euh, les gens de la salle Parce que j'aimerais bien qu'on fasse euh, deux secondes passer le micro pour qu'on choisisse chacun son nom de légumes. Enfin, peut-être pas chacun, mais genre une rangée de personnes, quoi. Est-ce qu'on a un petit, euh, un petit mic Je prends le mic pour la pagaille. Ah, cool, merci. Alors, choisis une, une rangée où il y a genre un peu de personnes, quoi. Voilà, je te laisse choisir. Voilà. Alors, quel est votre nom de légume <coughs> Personne ne juge personne dans cet établissement. On non. est tout, en, tout en, en, en couleur vive de bienveillance. Vas-y, je t'écoute. Bonjour, je m'appelle Aubergine. Ah, oh, oh. Tellement stylé, toujours sexuel. À toi. <rire> Euh, Topi Lambour, Oh là 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 là. En plus, ce n'est pas pris dans la série. Quoi. Putain, mais Donc, c'est un truc de ouf, perso, ouais. Qui est... And the second, uh, ben voilà, je... sorry. the second episode 
So you're the bâtir. beginning of it. Final. Pour le numéro 2, de à bientôt de te revoir. Générique applaudissement, s'il vous plaît. Voilà. Bon, attendez de voir ce qu'on va dire avant d'applaudir si longtemps. Euh, je mettrai un vrai, un vrai générique en post-prod quand on aura <rire> les moyens. <rire> Marine, je suis ravie de t'accueillir pour cette, ce numéro 2 de « À bientôt de te revoir ». Est-ce que tu connais la genèse de « À bientôt de te revoir » Oui, c'est ta mamie. C'est ma mamie qui me dit ça sur ses messages vocaux. Parce qu'une fois, je lui ai dit « Je t'aime », elle m'a répondu « Pourquoi pas ?» Et donc, <rire> Je préfère le préciser à chaque début, comme ça c'est bien clair. Il y a une question que j'ai posée la dernière fois à Patrick, d'ailleurs, qui est à côté tel un panéliste, euh, pour nous dire si c'est OK cette, cette deuxième, ce deuxième épisode. Pour l'instant, ça se passe bien Moi, je me régale, hein, là, vraiment. Euh, ouais. Il adore se régaler. Donc, euh, OK. So, as you can see, at first, SML capitalized on the countercultural status of her podcast often referring self-deprecatingly to the lack of sponsors, jingle, or applause. A bientôt de te revoir now begins with a jingle, applause, and an introduction of her guest sitting in her studio or on a plush couch at the Nouvelle Seine for a live show. And she she really, um, uh, the style of uh, the podcast is audio, but it is also a live performance once a month, as you can see here. She begins right away with a question in the style of cards for humanity, often or mostly even in relation to food. For example, in a recent episode in which she hosted Eddie de Preto, she began the entire conversation not by asking him about a recent album, song, or upcoming project, but requested that he improvise the best insult using fruits and vegetables. Driven by audience reaction and participation via Kikuti, or a, a sort of sonorous scatter plot, SML has developed a number of traditions as the podcast became more famous, such as guessing the astrological sign of her guest, asking absurd hypothetical questions, and delivering a, fri a friandise meant to spark a memory or interesting and unexpected story. This friandise, the object of my analysis today, is a unique communication device for an audio medium. It is chosen by SML specifically for each guest and secretly wrapped, which triggers a flattered giggle and sparks curiosity, both from the guest and the audience or listeners. However, the friandise is not a meal. It is not food with nutritional value, nor is it chosen for taste. Instead, it is often unhealthy junk food or processed food. In other words, it is food that is meant to fuel stories, not bodies. The treat itself may or may not be appreciated. In fact, a strong negative reaction such as disgust is as welcome as a genuine thank you. Unless part of a film show, the treat is not visible and must be described by the guest. It then serves as a memory trigger and story starter consciously alluding to Proust Madeleine. It is meant to provoke a reaction, both from the guest and from the audience, some of whom are in the room, other times participating in real time via chats on the social media live stream. So let me show you an audio of uh, one, one example. Uh, horrible. Et donc moi, c'est le ré... Je vais commencer par t'offrir ta friandise parce qu'il y a une tradition, on doit bientôt te revoir, c'est que chaque invité reçoit sa friandise personnalisée que je vais chercher euh, en allant fouisser dans les étals euh, de, des magasins attenants, des unités commerciales physiques attenantes à mon établissement personnel. Et j'ai décidé, j'ai galéré en fait, parce que j'avais euh, envie de te ramener plein de trucs, euh, genre des ors et de, de la mire, tu vois. Et en fait, je t'ai pris ça, donc je te laisse le déballer. <rire> euh, C'est des bonbons à la réglisse. Euh, et en fait, je, je déteste ça. <rire> je crois que c'est le truc que je déteste le plus au monde. Mais justement, <rire> le, la friandise que j'offre, ce n'est pas forcément pour Un faire plaisir. C'est parce qu'il faut que ça rappelle quelque chose. Et je pense, parce que j'ai un, un, un petit peu lu ce que tu sais. <rire> And here in the next slide, you can see uh, the sort of immersive chat in the live stream of the podcast where people uh, weigh in on whether or not tapunad yeune, and then that she sometimes brings in what they say and it becomes, it takes a story in a totally different direction. Uh, Sophie Marie loves food and finds every opportunity she can to talk about it. She claimed in a recent podcast hosted by Zazie Tativian, Dans le ventre d'eux, and I quote, c'est quand même la joie de la vie de manger, on est d'accord, end quote. 
However, though food is a central aspect of French culture, it is not a topic that will necessarily lead to a lighthearted conversation. My French grandmother used to say, and I quote, les goûts et les couleurs ne se discutent pas. Opinions about food are strong and oftentimes unflinching. Relationships with food can be complicated and unhealthy, connecting body image and societal pressure. Here she explains the friandises and you see her shopping for them. Bah, Vas-y, frère, coupe le saucisson en deux et donne-moi la moitié, hein, tant que tu es. Saucisson partout, justice nulle part. J'anime un podcast qui s'appelle À bientôt de te revoir. Et à chaque fois qu'il y a un invité qui vient, je lui offre une friandise qui va le faire réagir. Voilà. Donc là, pour moi, c'est là, je suis en train de travailler. Là, je regarde. Donc le nougat. En plus, c'est du nougat Diane de Poitiers. Diane de, Diane de Poitiers qui est morte parce qu'elle a mangé de l'or. Vous saviez ou pas il y a un coulis de caramel là et je vais bientôt recevoir Z Young Pavarotti et je pense que ça lui irait bien un coulis de caramel. Oh, ça me fait rire quand les gens t'offrent un truc et ils oublient d'enlever le prix dessus. Oh non. D'ailleurs, je me demande si ça serait une bonne question à poser. Euh, C'est quoi ta politique quand il y a le prix sur le cadeau Est-ce que tu fais genre « Ah, merci !» et tu l'enlèves Ou est-ce que tu dis « Bah dis donc, eh, ça va Bah vas-y, frère, coupe le sou. So as you can see, um, the friandise also sparks the idea of which question she will ask her, her next guest as well. So unlike other more serious feminist podcasts, A Bientôt de, de, de Te Revoir is unabashedly frivolous. You might consider it a friandise uh, be, between more serious and feeling meals. This frivolity is a cal calculated apparatus. Not only does Sophie Marie genuinely want to hear interesting and un unexpected stories to get to know people better, she is inserting herself into a medium in a new way. Instead of starting with a topic or serious thematic content as other podcasts do, Frivolity off affords the possibility to change directions and follow where a conversation leads without imposing intellectual boundaries to it. As Shira Chess writes, and I quote, play is a radical disruption. Feminism is all work and no play. But play has countless implications that exceed the boundaries of frivolity. In order for a woman's movement to ultimately be successful, playful dispositions need to be integrated into politics, technology, workplaces, sports, and families, end quote. By rethinking this podcast frivolity or stories of les riens quotidiens as a radical disruption to an evolving medium and a response to thinking of seriousness as a necessary element of activism or intellectualism in feminist contexts, SMN has already reshaped language through the evolving medium of podcasts in French. She has been called une sage femme allégorique, birthing others' stories. The spontaneity of stories in A Bientôt de Te Revoir demands a different type of analysis, one that examines form and tone over content. It is interesting to think of this podcast as middle brow due to its counterculture status in a medium that is not literature, yet relies on immersive strategies and narrative structures. In fact, the countercultural elements of the nesting conversations mean, means that it remains middle-brow despite achieving mass listener or low-brow status. Yet it is not serious but popular, as Diana Holmes writes in her study Middle-Brow Matters. It is popular, yes, but it is also playful and frivolous, all while providing a space for the importance of storytelling. Even the silliest stories seem to disrupt the organizing power of a new medium that is also trying to be taken seriously. This is a productive disruption, a joyful, playful, and compassionate disruption that, as Holmes says, and I quote, extends one's cognitive and emotional range beyond that of direct lived experience, enabled, enabling an experimental ascent um, to alternative ways of seeing and reacting to the world, end quote. Sophie-Marie Larouille's conversations with strangers causes us to rethink communicating with the other. I will end with her own words. Qu'est-ce qui fait qu'on trouve encore la joie de recommencer? Je pense que c'est le fait de ne pas avoir rencontré tout le monde. Thank you. And stop share. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Johnson, and also Emma for your first presentation. Both of them were extremely interesting, and I very much enjoyed both of them. Um, luckily, we now have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions, so I'd like to open that up. Um, so there's going to be a couple ways we could do questions. All right, thank you very much, both of you. I believe that Professor Dubreuil had his hand up first, and then there's going to be a question by Ellie Walters that she put into the chat. But first, uh, Professor Dubreuil? Well, you can just call me Sebastian. That works too. All right, thank you.
I already feel like I'm raising the average age of this, uh, uh, you know, amazing audience by like 20 years on my own. So I, 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 uh, <laughs> I think the title even adds to the. <laughs> so, um, I also really deeply regret that there is not more of my uh, uh, gender colleagues to support what you all brilliant people are are doing based on the first two presentation. That we're going to have to rectify that situation. I feel like this is pretty appalling. But anyway, I'm very happy to be in the audience. Um, I actually have a question for both Emma and Adrian. So I, I, since Emma is the floor, I guess we'll, we'll uh, start with that. Um, I, uh, my question for Andrea was about um, um, the, um, the, the whether or not we, we can uh, speak of a, of a disruption with the frivolity and the quotidian or rather a continuation. I mean, there's many, many examples in French uh, literature and um, the arts of the obsession for the, for the daily, right? From, you know, Vincent de Lerme, uh, or Philippe de Lerme rather, and, and his uh, Petite Vignette, uh, all the way back to Marcel Proust and his Madeleine, and then, you know, it's a, you know. And, uh, and so I'm wondering how this is, uh, a long-standing trope in French culture versus uh, a disruption because of the newness of the media and this multimodality and so on and so forth. That's a good question and uh, something I should think about incorporating um, because yeah, la vie quotidienne and every all the little the little aspects of the of the rien, you know, something that we we don't necessarily think of as as worthy of a, of a story. I think that that's not only a French. Um, uh, trend right now, but you see in in TV shows um, like that that the TV show Search Party, for example. I don't know if you've seen it on HBO, but I've been watching that. It's really about um, taking very 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 little things that happen and making them into a, a very big story, right? Um, I think that she is very aware. Uh, she was a literature student, a journalism student, um, and she is very well read. And I'm sure that she thinks about that. And so if, if for the next steps, I would definitely want to know her um, um, sort of conscious uh, philosophy on the frivolity of these stories. I do know that in her new podcast, it's more, it's more serious, it's more sociological. Um, and she, uh, on est chez nous, and it's a real response to the that phrase being used by the extreme right in France. Um, and she, her response is, "Vous êtes chez vous, nous aussi on est chez nous." Um, so, uh, and she goes around and, and speaks with all these people who don't necessarily uh, have never necessarily been connected to any larger discourse, right? Um, and so, I, I think that there is an aspect of her. Um, willingly making everyday life uh, into something important and something that needs to be archived in some way, archiving these voices uh, of people who, who don't think of their, their lives as interesting, right? And so reframing what it means to, to be interesting and what it means to connect with people as well. I think that's her main, her main goal. So um, again, I think that that's a really good idea to sort of set the stage with a from a philosophy standpoint um, on the everyday, you know, from the 20th century on, and then, um, and, and, and what she's doing differently because podcasts are everyday and everyday media, right? So that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So that brings us to just about to the end of our time. So I just wanna thank our two presenters again, uh, Emma and Professor Johnson. You had wonderful presentations, they're very interesting, thank you. And I also wanna say thank you to everybody who attended and for your wonderful questions. Uh, really appreciate uh, all of your support. So thank you very much. Thank you for sharing, Eric. Thank you all. Thank you, Eric, and thank you all, yeah. Hello, welcome back to our first day of the immersive potential of literature and hybrid media. Thank you for joining us for that uh, second panel. I hope that everybody can hear me. Arlene, you're on my screen. So yes, you're shaking your head. <laughs> nice to see you and the Louvre. Um, so we'll get started because we have three presentations in this uh, panel, uh, a panel entitled uh, Immersive Texts by Women and for Women. Uh, so. 
before we start, um, a reminder that presentations are being recorded and that if you do not want to appear on camera, uh, you should turn off your, uh, your camera if you don't want to appear on the recording. Um, also, some Zoom etiquette, please keep your microphones on mute, and um, if you can, keep your camera on, and if you wish, uh, so that we have the feeling that we are actually together, you know, in Paris with Arlene. Uh, so, without any further ado, so this second panel, we start with uh, Viviana Petzulo. Um, she's a PhD candidate in comparative studies at Florida, uh, Florida Atlantic University. She holds a Laurea Magistrale master's degree in philology and a Laura Triennale bachelor's degree in modern arts from the University of Naples, Federico II. Her areas of expertise include 20th and 21st century literature, a special emphasis on women writers, visual culture, digital humanities, and translation. Her dissertation focuses on the ethics of collaborative writing in the French, Francophone, Caribbean, and Italian traditions. Her work appeared in the French Review, Gender, Sexuality, Italy, and the NEMLA Italian Studies. And her talk today is entitled Feminist Journals in the 1970s as Textual Collective Performativity. The floor is yours, Viviana. Thank you very much for uh, such an amazing presentation. I just want to mention that I did graduate, so I'm officially, <laughs> no, it's very recent, so. <laughs> and I am currently teaching for the University of Miami as a lecturer of French. So this is like the super latest update. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. I have a very simple um, PowerPoint. Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. So. Um, so my talk today is actually part of um, a bigger project. So I'm just starting um, contextualizing collective writing in, uh, in the context of feminist journals in, uh, in France during the, 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 the 70s. So throughout the 70s and 80s, collaborative writing transversely enters the debate about feminist writing practices and écriture féminine. By the beginning of the Fifth Republic, France has approved laws in, in favor of women's rights, such as reform to marriage law that allows women to the right to vote and offer them relatively economic independence from their husbands and give them legal access to birth control. This is very late in 1967. However, as scholar Diane Holmes points out, equality before the law is far from synonymous with effective social equality reminding us that women need to win the fight for emancipation, not only at the legislative level, but also on the social cultural one, creating and consolidating the image of a new woman. Scholars see the right to vote in 1944, the peak of the wave of, uh, of the first wave of French feminism and the events of May 68 as the two key events in the history of women's rights. The years in between mark the period that is famously defined as Bermuda Triangle of Feminism, a period in which the term feminism itself, feminist itself, raises controversial, controversial issues about how the meaning must be constructed in a particular sociocultural context. The year, one, um, the year 1970 sees not only the, the origin of distinct groups such as the MLF, but also a broader sense of fe feminist writing as a whole. Uh, we can consider the date of uh, August 26, 1970, when a group of nine women marched towards the Arc de Triomphe to put a rat on the tomb of the Soldan Connu, and they are stopped by the police who prevent them from actually reaching the, the site. Uh, the, this women's goal was to pay homage, not to do the unknown soldier, but to his wife, who is even more unknown, and that history has silence. Il y a, and I'm quoting, il y a plus inconnu que les soldats inconnu, sa femme. So has this attempt demonstrate from the very beginning of, you know, uh, what we can call feminist movement of the 70s. The intention is to break women's historical silence by creating a new language that is grounded in singular and plural identity. In the development of a collective feminist consciousness, the relationship between individual and the group becomes, becomes crucial and is part of a specific rhetorical strategy where the singular, again, the singular identity becomes the vehicle to establish a collaborative effort. The first public, you know, the first, the first public women uh, only meeting that takes place at the campus of the Sorbonne, women gather to collectively express their idea for the future. And in this sense, 
we can quote what Beatrice Franco uh, says about collective and transgressive uh, force of writing through, um, through manifestos, which manifests itself through the, fun through the function of the signature. So in this case, we can consider signature as a base element of textuality. And signatures, in addition, because in addition to fulfilling a semiotic function, so signature as a sign of identity and validation, and a diplomatic function that uh, reinforces a hierarchicized system of juridical actants, also invokes a dimension of performativity a la Austin. And I'm quoting, la signature est donc ancrée dans une situation, mais on a vu aussi que la force de la signature était le résultat d'un travail collectif, de l'association de plusieurs réseaux d'écriture. So in this sense, such performativity is the result of a collective work that entails the participation of multiple individuals within the communicative act, belying the seemingly singular nature of the signature. These aspects of collectivity and performativity are actually very extremely evident in manifestos and slogans and collages, a realm in which the speaking utterances coincide with action. This realm be belongs to uh, what we may call repertoire d'action collective, which consists which consists on the moyen d'agir en commun sur la base d'intérêt partagé. And I'm quoting Frankel again. In manifestos, signature play an important role because it, they provide authority and authenticity and establish an expedient connection between the individual and l'action collective, encouraging participation and mobilization. A prime example is the famous manifesto that uh, Simone de Beauvoir and along with others published in 1971 in Le Nouvel Observateur, um, and that the satirical uh, magazine Charlie Hebdo nicknamed as the manifesto of the Manifest des 343 Salop after the cover that Cabu drew. Then we can read Qui a engrossé les 343 Salop du Manifest sur l'Avortement? C'était pour la France. So, in addition to its historical value, this 1971 manifesto provides a sharper insight into the origin of a, of a collective identity negotiating between the individual and the collective, grounded in a political and writing collaboration. The use of pronouns shifts, um, the use of pronoun shows how the, the individual both represents itself and the collective, speaking on, on behalf of a multitude of women. A million de femmes se sont avortées chaque année en France. Elles, Le fond des conditions dangereuses en raison de la clandestinité à laquelle elles sont condamnées, alors que cette opération pratiquée sous le contrôle médical est des plus, de plus simples. On fait les silences sur, de, sur ces millions de femmes. Je déclare que je suis une d'elles. Je déclare avoir avorté. De même que nous réclamons le libre accès aux moyens anticonceptionnels, nous réclamons l'avortement libre. In this case, the incipit of the tax contains a central, uh, a central shift. The subject pronoun moves from elle to je and to non. So the, these rhetorics bridges the gap between l'autre femme, and we may quote uh, Irigaray's terminology, and the speaking subject, allowing all women to become author of the document thanks to the deictive property of the first person pronoun, both singular and plural. So why the text summarizes uh, the collective's demands for free access to contraception and the right to legal abortion, the most revolutionary part of uh, is the, the actual list of, of names under signing the document. This is an all women manifesto, unlike previous petitions in French um, politics. And um, among these 343 women who signed the document, there were well-known authors, such as Beauvoir itself, Marguerite Duras, Violette de Leduc, and Monique Wittig, and uh, celebrities, Catherine Deneuve, but also everyday women. So with the exception of a few women who only sign using their initials or the first name for legal protection, the rest publicly declare that they have, have undergone illegal abortions. Um, an analysis of the names also interesting uh, shows that there were women from different generations participating in the signature of, of the document. So in this case, manifestos become a way to use the authorial power of the signature to make collective demands and occupy a political space. Uh, scholar Christine Fouré signals the importance of rediscovering and studying these collective documents by pointing out how historians have overlooked women's public interventions and collective petitions. She argues that feminist practices, actually, we can say that they go as back as far as the French Revolution, when women came together to express their demands and discontent in the Cahiers de Dolence. 
Uh, these documents were a list of grievances compiled by the three states in use since the 14th century, actually, but they gained notoriety during the revolution when Louis XVI reinstituted them for, during the Estat General de uh, 1789. So recording themes in these women's cahiers include the right to divorce already in, uh, in the 1789 and to defend the country. And as Fure further explained, such collective petitions are signé, and I'm quoting, signé sous le nom d'une femme connue pour détourner les règlements et échapper la censure lors de leur présentation à l'Assemblée. Uh, precisely what we actually saw in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the manifesto that we have just read. So a notable example is uh, a petition in favor of women trainship as guards that uh, in, um, a, a Madame Pauline Léon signs uh, along with, uh, and I'm quoting, 300 and calque signature. So in a way, we, we see another uh, 343 women that uh, from, from a different century. Uh, who she is, this uh, Madame Pauline Leon, we don't know who she is, and we don't know if she was the actual uh, writer of this petition or she was just a spoken person, um, we don't know. In addition to, um, to manifestos, also slogan become a form of collaboration in writing that uh, engages with political activism. Uh, in this sense, um, as John Lanchon Austin reminds us, speaking the utterance coincides, coincides with actions. So as compared to manifesto, banners and slogans also imply a material component so of, the writing, uh, of the writing activity, which emphasizes l'action d'écriture. This materiality is not only visible on the banners that feminist groups use during demonstrations, uh, but also in the mise en page of feminist publications and feminist journals, which bring with handwritten slogans, drawings, and comments and comics. Uh, in this context, the writing act is so deeply connected to the language. And I'm quoting from Frankl again. En introduisant la notion d'acte d'écriture, nous pouvons... Um, uh, désolé. Uh, d'acte d'écriture, nous pouvons uh, aussi l'hypothèse générale qu'en écrivant, nous réalisons éventuellement des actions d'écriture spectaculaire au nom et qu'il est possible de considérer l'ensemble de ces actions au sein d'une anthropologie pragmatique de l'écrit. This anthropologie pragmatique de l'écrit, uh, which Frankl considers to be essential to the writing act, recalls to, again, to what Austin's, to Austin's concept of perlocutionary act, that focuses on the effect produced on the reader and therefore the essential promotion of political engagement. Feminist journals like Sorcière, Les Torchons Brûles, ground in this act d'écriture, the creation of a shared authorial community. They bring together the, the editorial team and the readers who are actively called into action, not only by the slogan itself, but also by the pragmatic and performative form that the message entails. In this vein, the writing practice of feminist journals evokes, again, this concept of polygraphy, which illustrated this act, the, the act aspect itself of collaboration. The pragmatic component that works as a call to action, as an invitation to collaboration, is also the raison d'être of a journal like uh, Torchon Brûle, uh, a journal menstrual created within the MLF. The expression of course menstrual instead of mensuel refers to the menstrual cycle. Uh, the first uh, is interesting because the journal first came out as an insert to Lidio Liberté in, uh, 19, in uh, December 1970. Uh, again, this, the same year 1970 comes back and later becomes an autonomous journal. The first journal, unfortunately, we cannot, we cannot see in the picture, but the first journal had along the edges had dotted lines that encouraged readers to actually cut the page and assemble the pages together to make a booklet. So the gesture of material participation is coherent with the editorial line that intends to blur the boundaries between those who write and those who do not write. And, and I'm quoting an expression by uh, Philippe Lejeune. In this sense, uh, there was in the journal, there was no editorial policy, no column on the page, no rubric, no, no and, and actually was promoting drawing and picture and handwriting and typescripts in all colors, and uh, they shared the same, um, the same space on the page. The editorial staff itself changed every time and did not have a structure organigram. Contribu contributors did not sign the articles with their names. So again, this idea of signature that we saw before, but this as a way of project le nom du père uh, and express the collective, the collective production of such articles. And later on, of course, along, especially in the 80s, name, first names started to, to appear and then eventually full names. 
Um, just uh, the, my last uh, example, I want to bring the article Concepcion and Avortement Libre Gratuit, published in the first issue of Le Torchon Brûle, engages with MLF campaign in the support of legalized birth control and abortion. And after an introductory section in which the collective explains the dangers and risks of such practices, when not fully legalized and safely made available to all women, if all of the um, collected um, different experience, if all of to collect different experiences and discuss these themes, it also informs of letters. Unfortunately, you cannot really see, but there are like uh, testimonies of uh, of women telling their stories. So, for example, um, one of the testimonies of uh, Madame Renée Gerlain Agnard is particularly illustrative. She talks about how she went to Switzerland and uh, why she went there to get the abortion, and then she concludes the article with "Je signe." Uh, or Gerlie uh, Anya. So she, she actually, she engages again with the idea of signature as taking action over, um, over her act, also in terms of writing. The article, the article also feature a call by the movement of Pour la Liberté de l'Avortement, it, it's, it's here, um, in, uh, in, in promoting free access to birth control and abortion. Uh, the call mentioned the manifesto, directly mentioned the manifesto of the Nouvelle Observateur from the same year, and, and it's very evident uh, the similarities between the two of them. Um, Il faut faire tomber ces murs. De, num de nombreuses femmes ont déjà ajouté leur signature. Envoyez les vôtres. Uh, les, les vôtres. Nous les publierons à 10 000 signatures. Rejoignez les groupes de quartiers qui se sont déjà formés, formés de, formés, formés dans d'autres, à votre travail, à votre domicile. Ce texte a été envoyé à la presse le 10, le 10 avril. Aucun journal ne l'a repris ni, ni mentionné. La presse a publié, utilisé et vendu nos signatures. Elle ne, elle ne nous a pas laissé parler. Ce que nous disons, c'est l'opinion de la moitié de la population française. Cette opinion n'a jamais, nulle part, eu la permission de s'exprimer. Cette opinion a été, s'était exprimée par les journaux. Nous, on n'aimait pas que des femmes parlent pour elles-mêmes. Désormais, c'est ce euh, nous qui ne admettrons plus qu'on parle pour nous. Prenons la parole. And this is written in uh, caps lock. So women are invited to take the floor through their signature, through their names, forming a new polyphonic and polygraphic collectivity that expresses the demands and needs of the movement. The, this three pages article uh, includes different textual forms uh, by different contributors. Uh, different style is informative, explaining the risks. Again, includes a call for action, invites women to contribute, testimonies, letters, illustrations, comics, uh, depicting a, a dialogue between two women, one, for, one uh, advocating and one against abortion. And this polyphonic and polygraphic effects aims to recreate on paper the same collective environment behind the editorial work of the journal. So to conclude, collective writing becomes a pivotal tool in terms of feminist call for action. And the boundary between the reader and the writer blurs to the point that the text, as the title of the panel uh, suggests, becomes immersive and perlocutionary experience based on textuality as a form of political engagement and the creation of a new female femi feminist um, subject that develops a new language and therefore a new vision on society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Viviana, for this very thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, we'll leave questions for the, for the end of the, of the panel. So our second um, intervenant is uh, Sandra Darozzi. Uh, oops, let me turn my page. Um, she's a lecturer in French studies at the Univers University of Bath. Um, she carried out her doctoral research at the University of Exeter with a project analyzing, analyzing the reception of fictional works by contemporary French women writers. She guest co-edited a special issue of L'Esprit Créateur in 2018 and has an article on depictions of food in Marie Dariussec's work in a special issue of the Journal of Romance Studies in 2020. She's also contributed to edited collections with chapters on Dariussec and Julia Kristeva, and she's currently working on a monograph examining the reading dialogues put forward by Monique Wittig's fiction. And her talk today is entitled Reading Between, between in parentheses, uh, the lines in Monique Wittig's fiction. Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. Can I just confirm if you can hear me all right? Yeah, fantastic. I'll, I'll share my screens and Michelle, if you, I've timed myself and I'm just about one or two minutes over, but
but if it's a problem just tell me and I'll go straight to the conclusion so I've, I've timed myself that way as well so if I can just share there we go I'll share this and there we go and I suspect that you can all see my screens my my powerpoints excellent so um thank you so much for for having me and I'll get started with the with the presentation so on Friday the tw the 17th of September 2021 I was really lucky to be able to go to Paris and take part in the inauguration du jardin public Monique Wittig in Paris in the 14e arrondissement and as you can see from the sign of the garden, we've got the name of Monique Wittig, écrivaine, militante, lesbienne, féministe. And as all the participants noticed, it was one of the few times that we have the expression militante, lesbienne, laying claim onto the French public space. And this idea of laying claim onto a space, especially in our case, onto writerly space, has sort of inspired this, this talk. And when we think about space and laying claim onto a space, we might think about materialité. And when it comes to materialité in the context of Wittig's work, we might think about la materialité des mots, la materialité de l'espace de la page, et la materialité de la typographie. Now, for the purposes of this talk, I'll only focus on the last two, so the blank page and the typographies. And there's two more ideas that guide the sort of reflections in this talk. One of them, belongs to Monique Wittig herself, and it was published in Le Chantier Littéraire. And it's this idea that il y a une plastie du langage sur le réel. So language can shape, can leave marks, can leave imprints onto physical imprints and physical marks onto the world, onto the real world. The second observation belongs to Christine Planté, who wrote the preface to Le Chantier Littéraire. And it's actually She's re referencing the relationship that we as readers have with Le Chantier Littéraire, so what kind of work we need to do when we engage with Le Chantier Littéraire. But actually, I think that her observation can easily be extrapolated to other texts by Monique Wittig. Donc, quel que soit le travail d'universalisation auquel se livre l'écrivain, il appartient au lecteur de fournir la moitié de l'effort. And it's this idea of meeting, of the meeting between lecteur et écrivain on the blank page and the co-creation that happens that will kind of guide the rest of the talk. And I've decided to focus on two texts, um, starting with Les Guerrières, which was published in 1969. And even if you're not familiar with Wittig's work or with texts by Bonique Wittig, you've probably heard about sort of two of the elements that really set Les Guerrières apart. One of them is the use of the L, as you can see on the right-hand side, and the L becomes the universal pronoun. It is the pronoun that almost exclusively dominates the text. There are exceptions, but it really dominates the text. And it becomes a sort of a universal pronoun to refer to the community. And then you might also know that the text is interrupted by lists of names, as you can see in the two images. So they're um, images, um, sorry, lists in capital letters. And they're basically a list of names, guerrières, that are sort of a rich tapestry of different cultures, religious, historical events. So all of this is brought together. Now you might be familiar with these two elements, but there's another one that I would like to sort of draw your attention to. So in addition to those innovations, the pronouns and the list of names, we also have this circle. And as shown in the picture, the circle appears three times in the text, on page eight, on page 70, and on page 138. Now, the consensus in the literature, as it's highlighted by, by the quotation, and as was said by Monique Wittig herself, is that these three circles divide the text into sort of three parts. The slight problem is, is that these three parts, whilst they follow each other in the text, they're not chronological in terms of the story. So the last part, the one that would start with the circle on page 138, is actually within the story, chronologically speaking, the first part because that's when we see another pronoun, il, and that's when we see the conflict between el and il, and we see the war, the fighting, and it ends with the victory of el. And then we come back to the start of the text when we see how el makes sense of the world they live in. So following that logic, the first part that we read in the text is chronologically in the story, the second, and the second part we read is chronologically in the story, the third. The reason for that, as Vitik herself highlights, is because otherwise 
L couldn't have gained, couldn't have had that universalizing force. They had to be at the start of the text to take control of the text. Otherwise, they wouldn't have become a universalizing program. Donc, ce qui a forcé à bouleverser la chronologie du récit et fait intervenir le début à la fin. However, with all this in mind, I do want to ask a couple of questions. Is there more to this circle than just that? Is, it, is there more to it than just dividing the text into three? Why a circle and not any other shape? And also why such a prominent position? So it takes up an entire page. We've got a blank page with it. So it's not just a small symbol at the start of each part. And actually the results, sort of the responses to some of these questions are found in the text itself. So there's a link between the imprint, the physical shape, and the, the meaning of the text. And throughout this presentation, you'll see, I'll sort of refer to the quotations that I've got up, got up on the slide, but I won't be reading them all out just to save time. So I'll, I'll kind of be quite quick at going through them. If you look at the page numbers, you'll see that all of these are from before page 70. So they're technically in the first part that we read in the text, but chronologically in the story of L, it's the second part. So after their victory, right? And they're trying to make sense of this world. And we see that the circle, the shape of the circle takes on symbolic values. Um, the circle with different variations. So we've got le haut, le zéro, le cercle, but it's also associated with l'anneau vulvaire. And we see this association between le cercle and la vulve ou l'anneau vulvaire several times in the, in the text. So it becomes associated with the female body and with a specific part of the female body that would differentiate women's body from other bodies that might appear in the text. Then the circle itself becomes a tool for understanding, for making sense of texts, legends, myths, foundational stories, and other symbols that L might be carrying with them from the world they've sort of left, but they need to make sense of how their image was constructed. So le cercle becomes a fil conducteur pour lire un ensemble de légendes. And then the circle or variations thereof, we might see variations such as les ovales, les ellipses, or again, zeros, O's, that kind of thing. They then refer to other objects. So for example, les bijoux, les bagues, and it's not difficult to extrapolate from les bagues to wedding rings, and then to come back again to women's status. So we see that this circle with its various variations always comes back to some form of representation of women. Now, if we move to the second part of the text, which appears the second, but chronologically is the third, we actually see that the circle with all its variations, be it geometrical variations, be it other objects that look like a circle, be it bodily sort of be it elements of the body, particularly la no vulvaire and la vulve, we see that actually this imagery is relegated. So it becomes a stepping stone. It's admitted that L have used a circle to make sense of the world, but in their journey, in their evolution, it's sort of left behind. Il faut alors cesser d'exalter les vulves. So we're no longer thinking of differentiation. We're no longer thinking of the circle. These were tools that helped us make sense of the world, but dans, le, dans les premiers temps, leur ont été nécessaires pour rendre leur force évidente. But now they're sort of left behind. You know, we acknowledge that we've used them, but we need to move beyond them. So that raises a couple of questions for us because, and I've put in brackets the circle and the link to cave paintings. And if we've got time in the Q&A, we might come, come back to that. But we've seen that the image of the circle is used to kind of establish temporal frontiers. So it's used to sort of set order, despite the fact that this order is a bit disturbed with that final part becoming the first part. So it's not far-fetched to think of the circle as having an idea of frontiers, of borders, of outside and inside. The slight problem is that, as we said, that temporal order is disturbed. And for us, the inside of the circle and the outside of the circle are exactly, are exactly the same. They're blank spaces. I just saw that there's something in the chat. Is there some, can you hear me all right? Or is that, I can't see the chat, I'm afraid. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Sandra. okay, fantastic. No worries then. Um, and I know I'm going really quickly, so I'll hopefully I'll, I'll sort of catch my breath in, in the Q&A. But, so these are some of those questions, right? For us, the blank space is outside of the circle and inside of the circle. And what do we do with it? You know, it's, it's available to us as readers. 
The other problem is that this idea of the circle is an idea of repetition, right? It's, it doesn't have a start or a beginning. We can, we can sort of continue and go around it. So how does that fit with that idea of evolution? You know, how once we've reached section two, which is the sort of end of the story, then we go back to the start. So how do we make sense of all of that? And again, I think that, you know, there's that on a level, another level that we go back to the text. And the first quotation, I'm still sort of um, coming to grips with it because it's, it talks about sort of that three dimensional space. So we might have time to come back to it in the, in the Q&A. But if we look at the second quotation, we see early on that um, there's something called les féminaires that are being mentioned. And these are the petits livres. And we see Elle reading these, um, these books, sort of, you know, repeating um, what, what they read and also writing on them. Le féminaire présente de nombreuses pages blanches sur lesquelles elle écrit de temps à autre. Pour l'essentiel, il comprend des pages avec des mots imprimés en caractères majuscules dont le nombre est variable. Seeing this description of the féminaire, it's not far-fetched to sort of think, right, well, this is very similar to what we're reading because les guerrières has des pages avec des mots imprimés en caractères majuscules, etc. Les guerrières has a space where we can write, there's blank pages where we can change the text and write it. So then I would like to add two more sort of possibilities about this circle. Because if we think about it, as we go through the text, we learn how to read this circle. We learn how to read it as a shape, as that imprint on the, on the blank page, but we also read how to read it in the text as a symbol, as references, etc. So it's a heuristic reading. We learn by doing it. And in that case, once we've gotten to the end, if we do follow that circular return to the text, the way we return to it is with a completely different understanding of the circle. It's enriched, we know more about it, and we see how it's useful, but also how it's relegated to the margins. So that idea of the heuristic reading will kind of keep us going. So I'll, I'll keep coming back to it in the second text that I wanna talk about, which is Le Corps Lesbien, published in 1973. Again, if there's two things, even if you're not familiar with it, there's probably two things that, that people know about Le Corps Lesbien, is the fact that we've got in the text this list of bodily parts. You can see that on the purple cover, uh, but also throughout the text. So the text itself is interrupted by this very precise anatomical list of bodily parts. And probably the sort of biggest innovation that we associate with the text is this sort of split first person pronoun. So if you look back to the text, you will see that je and all its possible uh, sort of permutations as pronominal adjectives, so ma, me, anything like that, m apostrophe, all of that, we've got a slash or a virgule. Um, obviously, that is defamiliarizing. How do we read that in a text? If in Les Guerrières, the circle was on its own page, it was a blank page, okay, if I don't want to read it, you know, I can sort of not necessarily engage with it. But here you're forced to, because it's part of the text. So do you stop? Do you take a breath? What do you do? Do you, do you make a sound? How do you read that slash, that, that virgule, that line? So it's really defamiliarizing. But if you want to go through the text, you have to read it. So again, it's that heuristic uh, practice. So we sort of learn, even if we don't necessarily come to sort of to a full definition of it, we learn how to cope with it as we go through the text. Obviously, it poses different problems for translations and for interpretations. And here you've got some of the interpretations I have given to the split pronoun. Um, on this slide, you've got some really famous interpretations from the Anglophone world. So you've got Butler, you've got Sarah Cooper, you've got Vivian Wenzel. And here you've got some Francophone uh, reactions. It's not surprising that a split pronoun cannot sort of have unified reactions or unified interpretations. But the one I want to focus on is the one that Wittig has and quoted by Ecarnon. So Wittig se déclare physiquement incapable du jeu. Il s'agit d'un refus de croire en ce moi unifié, indivis, dont le pronom sujet est l'illusoire um, est l'illusoire garant. So there's, there's a s missing there. Um, and Ecarnon goes on to say that you know this this unified this idea of the unified jeu it's even more difficult for writers coming from the margins or from minority groups, be they ethnic, racial, sexual minority, etc. So there is this inability sort of, or to, to sort of have this unified speaking uh, position. 
So that makes us think, okay, if the je is inherently split for VT, that speaking sp position is like that made up of multiple units, then that makes us think of the list, which is made up of multiple units. Now, the list starts and finishes with le corps lesbien. So we've got le corps lesbien, then we've got the list, and then it ends with le corps lesbien. As I said, it's anatomically accurate, precise, and it's, it's, it's built with care. There's, there's a lot of bodily parts, you know, you sort of have to look them all up. And there's a tension at, in the text. There's a tension at the level of the je, right? We've got the je pronoun that we're familiar with, and yet it is split. So we may have to make sense of that. There's a tension between the whole, le corps lesbien, that starts and end the list, and it also gives the name to the text. But then we have all of these parts, all of these bits, this, this list that makes it up. And then we also see this tension sort of duplicated in the text itself, which is a lesbian rewriting of the Song of Songs, right? So in the text, the lovers sort of undo their bodies, they dismember and remember the bodies all throughout. And with this dismembering and remembering, we've got all of the pleasure that comes with that felt in all of the parts of the body. So how do we make sense of this tension between the whole and the parts that's manifested at least at three different levels? I don't necessarily think that there's an answer to the tension, but one way that sort of, or one indication that we have is fluidity. And fluidity is something that we see come up throughout Vitek's text. And if you look at the purple cover, as I like to call it, you will see that all of the parts of the body that are on the cover, and this is how the list starts in the text as well, all of them are fluids, all of them are secretions of the body. So none of them are just sort of, you know, kind of solid things. So coming to my conclusion, I just wanted to sort of come back to this idea of tension, because there's loads of tensions at work as we navigate as readers through these texts. First off, there's a very practical tension that Vitik herself must have sort of gone through when it came to typographical negotiations. You know, a pub, the books published in 69 and 73, how do you negotiate? Was, I want this sign, I want this slash, I want these characters, this size. There's quite a lot of typographical negotiation that goes on to actually be able to publish the manuscript in that form. Then obviously there's all of the links that we've spoken about between the lines, with a slash or the circle as a line and linking them back to the text. But what I'm mostly interested in is this tension between the familiar and the unfamiliar. And we're constantly confronted to it because we're familiar with the circle. We're familiar with a line, but we're not familiar with them in that context. We're familiar with some of the stories that Vitig talks about, but we're not familiar with them in the way that she rewrites them. So going back to Les Guerrières and to the last line of the epigraph, tout geste est renversement, tout est renversé, all of this sort of tension between the familiar and the unfamiliar. So if I am to circle back, to use my own sort of pun to the garden, I definitely think that the garden is a beautiful image to remember Vitig by. First of all, because of her personal love for gardens, because of sort of the textual links to gardens and flora, but also because gardens themselves are fluid and ever-changing. And I just kind of had a slide for Viviana as well, because this is um, sort of page three of Le Torche en Brûle, number five, published in 1972. And it's often attributed to Vitig, but as Viviana said, these are sort of anonymous uh, pieces. But in here, we've got the circle, which is filled out. We've got the slash, we've got the split pronoun. And we also have another innovation, which is the idea of un, moi. But un, moi, moi, spelt with an E at the end. So lots of food for thought there that kind of, you know, keeps us going with, with Vitig. Thank you so much. And I'll now stop sharing my screen. Let me just go here. And thank you, Sandra. And thank you. yeah, I'm sure we're going to have many, many questions. Thank you so much for this talk. Thank you. Uh, our last speaker today is uh, Marie Velikano. Um, euh, donc en français, elle est née à boulogne billancourt elle a effectué ses études supérieures en, Rus en Russie, à Moscou, euh, les a poursuivies par un doctorat en littérature française à l'Université de Lorraine. Sa thèse, soutenue en juin 2017, a été publiée aux éditions du CERF sous le titre « La sainteté chez Charles Péguy ». Elle est membre associée du Centre de recherche écriture euh, à l'Université de Lorraine et elle est également psychologue, titulaire d'un master en Russie. Elle s'intéresse à l'histoire des idées, à la manière dont une idée s'exprime dans un texte sur le plan formel, ainsi que sur les rapports entre la littérature et la psychologie. 
et son intervention aujourd'hui s'intitule « Texte avec X-Reader, un genre immersif de la fanfiction ». C'est à vous, Marie. Bonjour, hello. Uh, I have the same English. I don't know if it was a bad idea, maybe, <laughs> but I will try. Uh, I have no PhD in French, <laughs> in English. Yes, uh, I, have a, I have as well a disclaimer. Um, uh, I've, wor I've worked for 10 years on Charles Peggy, uh, and I've decided to work on fan fiction like uh, some months ago, so it's a start. It's, <laughs> it's a new topic for me because I wanted to change. <laughs> A bit. Uh, the, another disclaimer, it's uh, the title is not about women <laughs> and it's because, uh, well, uh, most part of fan fiction is really written by women, but uh, you can see I have no presentation because my PowerPoint bu bug and it's broken and it just, uh, I will try to share, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'll try to share the screen. It's it's just a Word document, but I have inserted uh, where it is hmm. here. Yes. Uh, when you want to know something about a fanfic author, you see this. <laughs> so. Uh, Sometimes I can say that it's a woman, but uh, because of the comment on the word uh, on the fiction, but not often. <laughs> so, fan fiction is a fictional writing by fans of a book, a manga, or movie, or even a real person or a group like a boys band, a TV show. Um, this book or show is called a fandom, a fanatic domain. For example, the Harry Potter fandom. It's books, movies, games, etc. Uh, and this book or movies uh, or movie is called Canon. Uh, the main sites where you find fanfics or fanfiction letter are of our own. Uh, the fanfic writers can use the canonic characters but change their fate, uh, play them in another word, uh, the real one or the word of another. For example, you can find uh, Harry Potter characters in, I don't know, Star Wars <laughs> word. Uh, it's a crossover fanfic. Uh, they can pair, uh, the writers can pair them, the character in different way from the canon. Uh, for example, I don't know, uh, you can find a relationship pairing between Draco Malfoy and Harry Potter. Um, the fan fiction, even without X readers, is immersive per se. There is a story where the fanfic writer is immersed in the world by his writing. He can change the fate of the characters, be equal to the author of the fandom. Uh, the fanfic writer can change the world somehow. It can be a way to overcome a psychological trauma sometimes or fight against an unfairness, uh, make justice win. Um, one of the immersivity factors is a specific fanfiction tongue. If you speak fanfic, you are a part of this work. Uh, each fandom has his one small glossary, but I will show the most common. Uh, uh, it's, it's in fact very short. Uh, I found some fanfiction dictionary, like uh, 10, 20 uh, pages of <laughs> terms. Uh, I've chosen some just to show uh, the fan fictions can be sorted by the length of the story, dribble a very short one, one shot, just one chapter. Uh, song fic, uh, it's a story with a plot based on the lyrics of a song. Um, sometimes the lyrics are inserted or not. Um, it can be based on gender like angst, uh, fanfic with dark themes, hurt comfort story, uh, well, when uh, one character is in, uh, is suffering and another comforts him. Uh, bearings, trigger warnings, 
uh, uh, OC uh, and other character, it means that the writer uh, has created his own character and inserts this in the fic. Uh, out of character, and when you change the, the character of a personage, for example, you have a very kind and nice uh, Severus Snape. <laughs> Ratings. Well, uh, writing and reading fan fiction is an experience somewhere between daydreaming, cosplaying, and role playing. The ability to play with favorite characters is, a, is an important modality of fan fiction, uh, in particular from the perspective of writers, but also from the perspective of reading, like children playing with dolls or stuffed animals. Fan fiction allows fans to take pre existing characters and tell them what to do. Uh, and the available filter options of her readers or from fiction control over their reading experience, I will show as well. Uh, it's very small. Uh, the additional tags you see, uh, you can uh, choose an anything, the author hashtags, pairings, genres, trigger warnings to create different reading experience that generate different effective responses. A reader can fine tune what they want the reading to make them feel. Uh, yeah, teenage drama. <laughs> well, um, multimodality is another way to make the fan fiction reading experience more immersive. Scientific author propose a playlist for each chapter uh, of long fiction or some gifts from TV show screen captured pairings them with uh, text from a fic, making the fix it interpretation of canon much more persuasive. Uh, once I have found a Harry Potter fanfic with photos accompanied with something like, this is Hermione's outfit in this moment. A lot of photos with outfits uh, inserted in the text. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, something uh, written by a teen, like th 13 years girl. <laughs> it's very funny. Another thing that makes fan fiction immersive is interactivity. Uh, the story can be changed in the common work um, with a beta. A beta reader is an unpaid voluntary editor who are like the writer fans of the original work. There is also a lot of interactions between the community members, the comments on the story, and it can change the story because somebody proposes in a comment a modification of the plot uh, and the writer accepts it. Sometimes the author asks for it even before the fic is written, and it's a common work in progress. You can see it. Uh, Est-ce qu'on propose une créature magique en tant que familier? <laughs> Est-ce que Harry Potter est une femme ou un, ou un garçon? Uh, voilà. <laughs> okay. uh, the classical self-insert is a fic with OC, other character. Uh, it means that you insert in the story a new character, and very often this character is somehow similar to you. But X reader is another kind, another kind of insert character. It's reader represent the reader. Uh, not the author, the X reader, it's you, uh, the actual reader of the story. Uh, the advice of experienced and popular fan fiction writers for the beginning, uh, for the beginners, are quite different from the advice, um, for example, blogs on creative writing. Uh, those bloggers help people to write text with a reader uh, can emerge in a word. Uh, look around with the main character, join his emotions. Uh, but not be him. In the fanfiction, the real you are supposed to become the real character of the story. So the advices are different. Uh, here they are. Make your main character as, uh, yes, there are advices that I found uh, in some uh, texts on fanfic uh, sites. Uh, advices for the beginners <laughs> from the elders <laughs> more experience it so make it as vague and general as possible so that anyone reading your story can imagine that it's actually them leaving out the plot of your story uh, your character does not have a name a specific a city because you never know who is reading your story you should not add details about yourself 
Um, sorry. The pronouns. An X reader fic can be written in third person, but without name or characteristic, only action and feeling descriptions. It's often written in first or second person with abbreviation, your name, that you can insert and uh, read the story, uh, seeing this. <laughs> Uh, sometimes to enforce the sense of immersion, the author adds extends to abbreviation like uh, why I've in your favorite movie or your favorite song. Yes, and uh, another character speaks about uh, music and you, the reader, uh, answer that your favorite, mo favorite movies or movie or song is, and you name your, you place your favorite song. Uh, in this case, for example, uh, yeah, I will show it's <laughs> more, more easy. Um, yes, this is a quote from a fan fiction in uh, third person. She sniffled and then decided that uh, other characters speak with her and you can place your name your last name. Um, here is with you. Uh, the second person is um, most frequent, I think. You mentioned to nude, yes. Important things to avoid. Uh, writers should not describe the body of the X-reader, but the actions, yes. Uh, for example, uh, you cannot say uh, what is the color of eye, uh, the eyes color of the reader, but you can mm, say that I can narrow in anger, grow wide in shock, uh, glare at someone, um, but they are not green or blue because we don't know the reader's eyes color. Uh, sometimes uh, author decide to create specific types of readers, such a transgender reader, a plus sized reader, so that people will have an easier time identifying with a reader in the story. Uh, X reader uh, inserts uh, are also a way to, ex to help to regain agency for the person that experiences exclusion in the real world. For example, a gay person can change uh, um, make a straight character, or even a real singer, uh, make him gay and write a story about the relationship between a gay X reader and this real or fictional character. Uh, all the insert fix can fight ableism, for example, the X reader autistic and be accepted in the fic world. Uh, we can also found hurt comfort story with a depressed or traumatized X reader receive help from a fandom character. And sometimes in the comments, uh, you can see that uh, author, the fic writer, uh, explained that this is, the, uh, he mentioned it because he wants other person uh, to experience this comfort. Um, I don't know if I have time for it. Uh, I wanted to show a testimony uh, of a fic writer, because I think it's, yeah quite powerful. Well, I can show it and not read it all because it's quite long. Um, well, it's sterile, uh, writes from for uh, BTS, so it's not a book. It's a Korean boy, boys band. Uh, and uh, he uses her BTS reader in search stories to explore central themes that she is dealing with. Um, so Maybe I will not write, uh, read it. I, you can read it because without my bad English accent is better. <laughs> yes, I think I prefer to end with this testimony because something is it, I think it's quite powerful, yes. Mm. Let me scroll down just a little bit. Uh, 
Yes, yes, I yes, yes. I get so much joy out of telling someone, Luke, you are allowed to exist. You own your story. You have mass and power. You deserve to take up space. You can feel the freedom to do things that make you jiggle. For no other reason to enjoy a jiggle, you are full, lovely, float, hilarious, empathic, strange, kind, struggling, generous human, and you should be celebrated. In doing so, fan fiction reader and writer make space for fans like them to get the, your name treatment they deserve. So it's a kind of reauthoring practice. Practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, let me. Yes. Stop sharing your screen, Maria, and then we have. I... Uh... I don't know. I don't know how much time we're supposed to have. I would say maybe 20 minutes uh, for questions, comments. Maybe Michelle, if I can, I can I'm, I can start oh. with a question slash comment for Sandra. Um, Go ahead. So for, um, I really like your uh, your presentation, Sandra. And uh, I want um, I, I have like a couple of comments that I think can resonate with your presentation. First of all, um, I like how you were talking about the uh, linguistic appropriation of the urban space, and this made me think of something that um, of the collage that I was actually uh, that I very briefly mentioned. That of course I didn't have time to explore, but um, the, the act of, col of the collage like on on the walls. Um, as a as a form of appropriating, like taking uh, you know, taking back the the urban space, because as 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 you were you know as you were describing, is um, the urban space is always being associated with like a male space. So the also the the act of um, of graffiti and um, and the collage as part of like a political and uh, textual appropriation of the the urban space, and also. Um, about the geometric form of the circle, um, I found fascinating because uh, one of the books that I was uh, reading for uh, uh, in, in my research is uh, Les Femmes Sans Tête, uh, just this, col this collection of, um, uh, a collection published in 1975. And it's interesting because in the, there is a, a section with uh, anonymous testimonies uh, of women um, talking about their lives and their experience with, uh, with abortion. And at the end of each uh, testimony, it's, it's anonymous, so it's not signed with a, with a, with a signature, but uh, instead of a signature, it, we find a triangle. So I, it's interesting because you've talked about the, the circle, but also the, the triangle has been a geometric form that um, has been always associated with you know, femininity. And, and then we find, again, as a typographic sign and signature in different, uh, you know, in different works. And then my, my last question for you is that like you mentioned the cave paintings and this is one of my, one of my guilty pleasures. I love cave paintings. So I was uh, actually interested if you could develop a little bit more about uh, this aspect that you, that you mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Viviana. And thank you for your presentation uh, as well, and Maria, because I was taking lots of notes from both of your presentations and I was so happy that I could sort of put that slide in and got the time to to kind of echo to your to your study of Le Tour Chambrule. I absolutely love the you know that that your observation about that sort of the, the linguistic appropriation of the urban space. And I have to admit that when I went to Paris, you know, for the inauguration, I was really taken aback. I mean, first of all, for the fact that I was able to travel, you know, that was already like a sort of a massive thing in 2021. Well, I'm in Paris, you know, it was sunny. There was all of these things that were working out really well. And, but over and over, and, you know, I, I studied boutique for years and, you know, I was still sort of shocked by my ignorance because everybody was saying, you know, we don't, it's the very few times that we have the expression militante lesbienne on a plaque in the French public space. And I thought, you know, I kind of thought I never thought about this. You know, I knew that there's a street Monique Wittig in her hometown, but I never really sort of approfondir a bit more this idea that how important and how symbolic and how powerful it was. And on the um, um, Cahier Hypothèse, when they talk about the, 
the inauguration, they really uh, emphasize this idea that it says militant lesbian, and that's so important for, for the community. And it re you, you, you're absolutely right, thinking back to Les, les Colleurs. And I think what's interesting is that obviously with the kind of the post the collage that were inspired by uh, hashtag me too and by the high number of femicides in France, there's now a book. So they now, at the end of last year, they published a book yes, with their collage. Yes, this is, yes, this is what really what I was uh, thinking of. Yes, absolutely. So it's really, you know, that kind of the, the linguistic with the urban and there's definitely more to sort of to look in there. And uh, Les Femmes Sans Tête, I mean, it reminds me of the, the conference that uh, Diana Holmes with Alison, they organized for women in French a few years ago, which was themed, uh, it came from Les Femmes Sans Tête. Um, and for the triangle, the one, it's mentioned in Les Guerrières as well. And I guess, thinking back to your paper on Le Torche en Brûle, because in one of the numbers, they kind of teach you how to do the sign, don't they? And this is the sort of the, the sign that they used to do, the MLF used to do sort of throughout. So there's loads of, shapes there and the cave paintings now that I get to the cave paintings so cave paintings are mentioned in Les Guerrières and what I was hoping to try to sort of uh, push an interpretation is that because Les Guerrières is, an, is a rewriting of an epic poem so if we think about the Iliad or the Odyssey it's an epic poem of sort of women of Les Guerrières of El and there's a lot of rewritings of all sorts of foundational stories and foundational myths so I, I was trying to push the sort of the point at saying that Wittig is offering the page or the blank page as a sort of replacement from, for the wall of the caves to say, look, women have a place where they can express themselves because at that point, you know, in the first part of the text, we still associate the circle with women's bodies and with their expression. Um, and whilst obviously for cave paintings, we don't, we don't know who did them, you know, we don't, we don't have that sort of information in terms of genders, but, you know, women were sort of invisibilize in all of these foundational stories. So in a way, prior to write, prior to words, be they in the oral tradition or the written tradition, there's the pictorial. And this is a sort of a recreation of that, a recreation of a space to write back women into history and going as far back in time as possible. So that was kind of where I was hoping to push the interpretation with the cave paintings, but they are mentioned in Le Guerriere and I can look up the quotations. I've got it written down somewhere so I can send it to you. Um, I would like just to interject a little bit with, uh, there was a, in the chat, I don't know if you saw that Sandra, but Sébastien Dubray wrote The Cercle Égale Révolution, and your talk also made me think of uh, Chloé Delhomme's uh, text, um, uh -huh, Les Sorcières de la République, where um, they invented Le Parti du, du, du Cercle when they were trying to bring forth that uh, feminist uh, revolution. And of course, you must have seen that that garden that you, that was your last slide that it, the fountains are circles. Um, yes. So that's that's all my little thing I wanted to add. Other questions or comments? Uh, Sébastien Dubray, you have your hand up. We cannot hear you. Because yeah, I have two mute buttons, and so I have to mute twice, so that I really want to make sure that I'm not interrupting anything. So, That's Sandra, nice. I, I, plead, I plead guilty for <laughs> for interrupting you with the with the chat, but yeah, that made me think of revolution. And then uh, uh, one more comment: I don't know if you're at all inclined in in exploring that. I mean, you seem to have a really robust theoretical framework already to uh, buttress your your uh, your analysis. But when you were talking about appropriating the space and sort of subverting the, the you know the, the that that spatial discourse, uh, I don't know if you're at all familiar with um, uh, linguistic landscape studies as a as a field and and um, um, of course you know it has a very strong well at least the, the there's several strands of research and there's very interdisciplinary from cultural geography to you know all kinds of things but it has uh, it owes a, a, a large debt of gratitude to the work of Bourdieu of course but it's been adopted by um, um, a couple of researchers named Scolan and Scolan in their um, framework of geosemiotics uh, and uh, especially nexus analysis and you know that discourse in action in other, in, other, in other words what does it do to the public space and especially with your trope of the garden and the collage and then you know the, the sort of reassembling of uh, the sort of the you know the pieces of a mosaic in the public space uh, to to create new forms of discourse and new intertextualities and so on and so forth in space 
Um, and so if you're if you're at all inclined, uh, I, I encourage you to go and take a peek in in uh, in that direction. It might you might find it useful or you may think yeah i don't want to bother <laughs> and uh, a, a, a comment for uh maria uh, i don't know I, I applaud your efforts to uh to uh um i guess tread into new territories with uh with fan fiction and since we are all uh i think in part not only scholars but but uh, teachers of, of language i strongly strongly encourage you to go and uh, look at the work of Shannon Saro, who uh, is currently at the University of Maryland, if memory serves. Um, she So Shannon Saro, Rebecca Black, uh, Anna Oskos, to a certain uh, extent, have done some amazing work uh, on fan fiction as a genre, uh, one. And two, uh, how we can actually harness uh, what's going on in fan fiction areas uh, for the purposes of foreign language uh, teaching and learning. And so I, I think you will find it immensely useful for the pursuit of your endeavors. All right, thank you very much, Sebastian. Uh, Colette, uh, you have two questions or comments for Viviana and uh, Sandra? Oui, uh, Viviana, je, je trouve que c'est assez ironique on parle de, de feminist journals in the 1970s as textual collective, et tu l'as très bien montré. Après, mais qu'en même temps, enfin, j'étais une jeune femme à cette époque, euh, euh, nous savons aussi que ce textual collective est devenu très morcelé, puisque le MLF a, a vraiment foutu tout ça en l'air. Alors, je me demandais un petit peu si... Euh, Qu'est-ce qui s'est qu passé aussi Est-ce que c'est quelque chose que, que tu regardes aussi euh, euh, Comment ce, ce textual collective est devenu euh, un autre collective dans un certain sens En euh, fait, non, euh, dans le domaine, du moins dans, le, euh, dans ce qui s'est passé en France. Non, non, bien sûr. Je trouve ta question. Euh... Um, votre question très intéressante aussi parce que le, le, le concept des, des jeux et nous c'est assez c'est problématique en fait parce que il y a toujours la, cette uh, relation entre l'individu et les, la collectivité et le collectif c'est un peu um, il est aussi en implication de la perte de jeu donc uh, aussi au niveau théorique uh, il y a il y a toujours des des, des, pro, des problématiques en fait et donc, c'est intéressant comment, euh, aussi, comme vous avez mentionné, il y a cette euh, fra fragmentation de, de mouvements. Donc, euh, une des, 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 des thématiques, une des valeurs la, la plus importante, la collectivité, le groupe, la relation collective, mais que ça devient petit à petit, ça devient aussi la, la cause de la, de la fin du, du mouvement lui-même. Donc, euh, oui, c'est assez ironique, comme, comme vous avez mentionné, oui, tout à fait. Et, euh... Merci beaucoup. Excusez-moi de vous avoir tutoyé. Je tutoie très facilement. Euh, <rire> C'est mon héritage, mai 68. Euh, Sandra, j'ai une petite question. Une question simplement. Il me semblait, quand j'étudiais Monique Wittig, qu'elle n'était pas particulièrement contente qu'on l'appelle une lesbienne. Est-ce que je me trompe ou est-ce que ou est-ce que c'est quelqu'un d'autre et que j'attribue ça à quelqu'un d'autre De ce que je sais, euh, je reviens à la plaque. Je pense qu'elle n'était pas nécessairement contente d'être appelée écrivaine. I think that was a, a sort of I'm not sure how she felt about it and it was a decision. C'était une décision prise par par l'association les amis de Vitig et par la famille. Euh, aussi par sa partenaire Sandy Zayk, par sa nièce, justement pour, pour mentionner qu'elle était une femme écrivain, mais je sais qu'elle était assez, disons, oui, elle n'était peut-être pas très favorable à être appelée écrivaine. Pour lesbienne, je ne sais pas exactement, parce que dans des interviews, dans des différents interviews, dans des différentes périodes, elle parle de, de, de son militantisme, d'être lesbienne, euh, et dans ses écrits aussi, après, c'est différent aussi d'être appelée une écrivaine lesbienne, parce que ça aussi peut être réducteur au niveau des thématiques, peut-être, ou de l'interprétation. Donc, je pense que pour écrivaine lesbienne, peut-être pas. Mais pour militante lesbienne, je ne suis 
pas exactement sûre, mais je sais qu'elle elle, elle se réfère comme telle dans, diffé dans différentes interviews. Mais je sais qu'écrivaine, là, le E après écrivain, ça, ça a posé des questions pour, euh, pour la plaque. Il me semblait que c'était plus tard dans, dans sa vie, quand elle est enseignée aux États-Unis, où elle avait écrit, je ne me souviens plus dans quel texte, euh, que euh, elle aimait, sur le plan politique, elle n'aimait pas euh, qu'on utilise euh, euh, en quelque sorte cette étiquette de, de lesbienne sur le plan politique. Hein, mais donc je, là aussi, ça, ça aurait été. Mais si sa famille a donné son aval et tout ça, c'est que je dois me tromper. Mais j'ai ai énormément aimé ce que vous avez fait avec euh, les cercles et, et toutes euh, ces autres choses dont vous avez parlé euh, dans votre, votre travail. C'est vraiment euh, très, très intéressant. Ça fait revoir les textes, ces deux textes d'une autre manière. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Colette. Merci. Sandra, savez-vous si euh, la famille et le, le, et le groupe ont envisagé de, de mettre un... Oh, une barre, écrivain, barre, E Ça, je ne sais pas. Ça, c'est une très, très bonne question. Donc, je ne sais pas exactement co comment le, tout le processus de, de, de négociation, justement, pour la plaque, comment tout ça s'est passé, parce qu'ils ont beaucoup travaillé avec la, la mairie de Paris, le centre pour héritage, personnalité, etc., la mairie du 14e. Mais euh, à l'inauguration, on a eu des, des discours de la part de la, de la mairie, de Suzette Robichon, qui est la présidente de l'association Amis de, Les Amis de Vitique, de Sandy Zayk et de Dominique Sanson, sa nièce. Donc, il y avait justement sur le coming together de toutes les personnes qui ont, qui ont travaillé avec elle, qui font partie de sa famille, de sa vie. Donc, je pense que peut-être la, la plaque, est, on est arrivé à un compromis justement pour, avec la langue française, avec l'espace urbain, mais je ne sais pas exactement toute la négociation qui s'est passée avant. Je ne sais pas du tout, mais je peux demander. Et c'est une très, très bonne question pour voir justement maintenant avec tous ces débats autour de la langue française et de la féminisation, pour voir oui. si on a eu des débats sur cette problématique. Et de l'écriture inclusive aussi. Voilà. Ouais. Euh, D'autres questions ou commentaires en français en anglais Oui, Diana, pardon. Yeah, just to, to bring it back to the question of immersivity, um, the, I, I think of, of immersive reading, so we're all talking about reading here, in a sense, as needing um, a, a world, a textual world, which exists in some way independently of the volition of the reader that is there, and so that when one enters it, It's, um, it's there's a kind of dépaysement. You're, you're going outside your own subjectivity into something else uh, uh, as, as you read. Whereas, particularly in the case of um, Sandra and Maria's presentations and what you were talking about, that really is very, perhaps a bit less so in uh, Viviana's, but it really isn't the case. I, I would say in the case of Vitig, I think the intellectual effort That, that, that's needed in order to read such a, a, a foreign and difficult text means that you know the, the brain is, is very much working throughout and you're very conscious of your own subjectivity as you struggle with the text and in the case of fan fiction what you're actually being asked to do is to put your yourself into the story so it's very much to do with your own volition you know so I, I just wonder how you are each interpreting immersivity or immersion in a, in a text it seems to be in quite in a quite different way from you know, from the way that I normally think about it anyway so I don't know we could start with Sandra perhaps and then move on yeah sure thank you so much Diana and um, yes I think with, with that sort of idea in mind then then Vitig is is challenging and it is quite a, a tension Um, I think, you know, there's, there's a nuance with that sort of the tension between the familiar and the unfamiliar, because a lot of sort of the stories that we see in VT, and I'm thinking here more about Le Guerriere, because it's, it's sort of, it's peppered with things like LDs. So it's, it's actually sort of a recounting of stories that are being heard from, from Le Guerriere. And a lot of these stories, the stories that we know, whether they're religious stories or myths, with myths, 
some of them are a bit difficult in the sense that obviously you need to have that sort of context. Um, so it is it is challenging, but I think it depends on what sort of readings we do. So I'm probably guilty if you've seen the scans that I've put up on the on the slide. All of that has my writing on them. Uh, um, so I'm guilty of that kind of very pernickety, like I need to know what this word means. I need to know what this name comes from. But there is an argument to be made for sort of letting go of that and going more <laughs> towards the dipeismo and the immersiveness and just sort of letting go. It's probably easier in Les Guerrières just because of how the page is set. So you you almost encourage, you can ignore, you know, the names if you want and that sort of thing. In Le Corps Lesbien, it's probably more difficult mm. because you're struck by that sort of by the line all the time. So it's, I think it is more difficult in Le Corps Lesbien and it is more difficult as a text as well. Mm. And if I can say something to anticipate Maria's, because I think uh, it, it can draws on, she can draw on uh, on that. Um, first of all, I'm sorry. I I have like a construction site outside of my window just right, right now. I'm sorry. So hopefully you can hear me. I'm sorry. So the use of the you, uh, for example, in the case of feminist journals, the use of the you is extremely important because uh, it builds on this relationship between the je and the tu. And if we think about it, like even in terms of Ben Veniste, for example, like the you as the reflection of the je. And it's very interesting because uh, the whole narrative and the rhetorics that we find in the great majority of feminist um, militant uh, journals is again this idea of involving the reader with the you. And I found extremely fascinating what Maria was uh, explaining in her, in her presentation that now we, uh, we take a step ahead. So we don't, we don't use the you, but in, in order for us to emerge in the experience, we have the, um, the Y and N. So even here, like we also have like an, an um, uh, again, like a step ahead in terms of the pronoun, but also they can make it even more, again, inclusive. If we think about the whole discourse about pronoun and inclusivity, um, Maria demonstrated how this kind of uh, work can actually, again, open a whole new territory, which drawing on what Sebastian was also saying, can also be extremely useful in terms of teaching and in terms of involving students. So. Yeah, I found Maria's comment extremely interesting as well in terms of immersivity. Hmm. Is it okay if I answer in French? Parler spontanément en anglais est beaucoup plus difficile quand même pour moi. Il y a énormément de discussions parmi les lecteurs de fanfiction, parfois très houleuses, sur ce qui est <rire> utiliser le jeu, le tu ou le your name, uh, your last name, etc. Finalement, euh, la majorité des écrivains de fanfiction préfèrent utiliser le your name parce qu'ils pensent parce que c'est plus intéressant d'écrire. Finalement, parce que la majorité des lecteurs disent que ça les dérange, que ça les énerve, <rire> que voir chaque fois c'est l'abréviation et essayer de se souvenir surtout si c'est une euh, les abréviations sont toujours en anglais, quelle que soit la langue dans laquelle la fanfiction est écrite. Donc, si tu lis en français et tu connais mal l'anglais et tu tombes sur Your Name, toutes les trois, les trois lignes, ça énerve énormément et les lecteurs le disent. Donc, euh, en fait, ça ne facilite pas l'immersion. Par contre, euh, bon, ce qui la facilite, c'est plutôt... Euh, voilà, des, euh, bah, ce que j'ai montré dans les conseils des écrivains expérimentés, c'est plutôt finalement des procédés littéraires que euh, vraiment l'utilisation. Oui, c'est voilà, comment décrire, euh, utiliser ou pas euh, la description de la personne. Euh, ça apporte plus finalement à l'expérience et ça la facilite. Euh, mais en même temps, oui, ça, ça demande un travail comme... Euh, effectivement dans un jeu de rôle oui c'est mmh. oui, c'est un comment dire c'est c'est un autre type d'effort c'est pas le même effort qu'on a euh, quand quand on lit c'est un effort mmh. euh, de quelqu'un qui euh, joue un rôle un, un effort d'un acteur pas un effort d'un lecteur euh, par contre euh, le 
la quantité de tags utilisés, euh, ça facilite parce que tu choisis euh, en fait une, la fanfiction que tu lis. Si tu es lecteur, tu la choisis, euh, euh, c'est vraiment à la carte. Donc, euh, tu choisis celle dans laquelle c'est le plus facile pour toi de t'immerger. Mmh. Voilà, si en ce moment, tu éprouves, euh, bah, je ne sais pas, si en ce moment, je souffre de dépression, je vais chercher une fanfiction euh, où il y a un tag depression ou uh, uh, the reader is depressed. <rire> euh, si tu veux trouver de la consolation que tu ne trouves pas dans la vraie vie, tu mm. cherches une fanfiction with hurt comfort, euh, etc. Donc, tu... Tu choisis vraiment, il y a tellement de choix que finalement, tu peux justement choisir. Euh, ce sera plus facile d'éprouver, euh, de s'immerger dans l'histoire euh, que dans un livre euh, euh, fandom. Oui, parce que euh, tu ne pourras pas adapter le livre à ton expérience. Tu n'as pas changé Guerre et Paix pour... Euh, bon, je pense mmh. que tous les lecteurs de Guerre et Paix ont à un, un, un moment ou un autre voulu que Natacha épouse quand même le, le prince André, mais ce n'est pas comme ça dans l'histoire, parce que toutes les filles s'identifient à Natacha, d'accord, mais on ne va pas changer l'histoire. Et il y a d'ailleurs des fanfictions sur euh, Guerre et Paix. Hein. <rire> ça existe. Mmh. Voilà, je Marie, pas si... <rire> Excusez-moi l'interrompre, je voudrais vous demander si la, la pandémie euh, a changé euh, la fanfiction Est-ce qu'il y a plus d'amateurs plus Est-ce que ça a changé la, 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 le, 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 la forme aussi de, fan, de fanfiction Est-ce que ça a une incidence dessus euh, Je n'ai pas vu de changement de forme, mais il y a clairement un changement de quantité. <rire> ça, c'est sûr. Je, bon, euh, je voudrais travailler... Euh, continuer de travailler sur euh, spécifiquement euh, la fanfiction euh, Heart Comfort euh, sur Harry Potter parce qu'il faut que je me concentre sur quelque chose parce que comme je voudrais euh, relier mes études littéraires et des études psychologiques et travailler sur euh, la fanfiction Heart Comfort comme euh, aide à des personnes ayant souffert de trauma et euh, du coup je suis euh, le renouvellement euh, et en fait, il y a sur seulement les Archives of Our Own, un seul site, il y a quelque chose comme 12, 14 fixes qui, qui s'ajoutent tous les jours. Oh. <rire> bon, je, je ne sais pas parce que je l'ai commencé il y a quelques mois seulement, je ne sais pas comment c'était avant la pandémie, mais j'ai posé des questions sur les forums, c'était quand même à peu près deux fois moins. Donc, euh... <rire> bon, je n'ai pas de données statistiques, hein. je vais... Je, je vais euh... Mais atelier, mais pas encore. Euh, je ne sais pas s'il y a d'autres questions en commentaire, mais bon, l'heure tourne aussi. Donc, euh, à moins qu'il y, qu y ait quelque chose de vraiment pressant, euh, je vais clore ce, ce panel. En vous remerciant encore une fois, euh, euh, Sandra, euh, Maria et Viviana. Et euh, Bravo encore à, à, à toutes. Merci aussi pour vos questions et vos commentaires. Et nous revenons à ouais, mon heure, 14 heures, enfin, dans 7 minutes. Quoi. Euh, merci beaucoup. So, good morning to me. <laughs> And hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, um, wherever you are in the world. Um, thanks so much for... Um, Uh, participating in the symposium and for coming to the, the keynote. Um, I've unfortunately been able, unable to attend the previous panels today. It's been, um, the symposium started at 2 a.m. for me, so I'm really looking forward um, on catching up on all the things that you guys have been talking about. I'm sure it's been very interesting. Um, and hopefully everyone else will be able to help me um, draw some connections between the previous panels. Um, and uh, Michelle Bachel's um, keynote today, which I'm very excited for. Um, this is uh, cutting edge stuff in my field. And so I'm very, very privileged to be able to chair today. Um, just a quick reminder, it's being recorded. Turn your cameras off if you don't want to um, be a part of the recording. Um, if you would like to ask questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Um, but I'll ask you to save all your questions for the, for the Q&A session. Um, where are the other boring details do I have for you? Um, 
Yeah, so keep your microphone on mute. You're more than welcome to keep your camera on uh, just to simulate um, a more in-person environment. Um, hopefully that suits Michelle as well. Um, so um, we're very lucky to have um, Michelle Bachol um, here with us um, for her keynote. Um, she is a professor of French studies at Eastern Connecticut State University and has published numerous articles and books, uh, primarily on French and Francophone women writers, um, most notably uh, Anne Yernot and Linda Leigh. Uh, she also writes on the representation of uh, ethnic minorities in contemporary French youth literature and suicide loss survivors in Potorino, Vigan, Grimbert, Ramini, Charnot and Delhomme, and on the use of photo photographs by Annie Arnaud, Isabelle Monin, and Ransom Rick. So that's some of the, some of the stuff we're gonna see today with Isabelle Monin. Um, she also used her father's photographs as a catalyst uh, to his Algerian war testimony in her work, Un appelé dans la guerre d'Algérie, témoignage phototextuel from 2016. And her Annie Arnaud e-museum, Visite guidée uh, des, vrais, des vrais lieux arnaliens um, is her latest photo textual venture and I, I encourage you all to have a look at it. It's a really interesting um, way of presenting the life and work of Arnaud. Um, so I'll pass it over to you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thanks, Beth. Uh, so I'll share my screen. I've not done that since last semester, so. Uh, da -da -da. Okay. And of course, slideshow. From the beginning, where do I see from the beginning? Slide show from the beginning. Everybody can hear me and see what I have on my screen. Perfect. Thank you. So first, I'd like to thank the organizers for of this symposium and uh, and everybody that has presented this morning. Um, it's been a very interesting um, symposium so far, and I'm sorry, Beth, that you had to miss it, but I totally understand. Um, and it's it's really a feat for you guys to have organized it over three continents. Uh, so, bravo. Um, so instead of diving uh, head on into the two projects I'll discuss today, I invite you to dip our toes into Nick Nixon's photographs of the Brown sisters over a 40 year period. I remember spending more than an hour looking at these pictures uh, the first time around as I scrutinized the sisters' body language, their positioning in relation to one another, and their facial expressions. I took note of the wrinkles on their faces, their weight gain or loss, anything that may unveil life experiences and hardships that I could only imagine. Weddings and pregnancies, divorce, death and other losses, addiction and depression, fallouts and closeness when all we see are four bodies in time and space as indicated in the captions. Seven years later, I've, after, seven years after I read about them in the New York Times article, I can still lose myself in these. So why is that? Well, maybe these pictures talk to me because I feel time creeping up and leaving its marks on my face and body. Maybe because as an only child living in a foreign country, a sister's bond intrigues me. The bottom line is that they move me, uh, as I'm sure other photographs move you. Emotion is, a, is precisely what brought Isabelle Monin to write about the pictures of an unknown family she bought on the internet in 2012. Emotion is also what kept Clara Baudou in the cellar of her Parisian apartment where she found the previous deceased tenant's stuff. Both Mona and Baudou fell under the spell of their person and eventually gave in and wrote about them. Both produced a doubly hybrid project since Les Gens dans l'enveloppe and Madeleine Project combine documentary and fiction, photos and text. I'll question what, beside this double hybridity, summons us, makes us dive in and once in how we interact with the project. So I'll start with uh, photo textuality. Um, in literature, the mix of photographs and text dates back to Georges Rodenbach's um, 1892 Bruges La Morte, and the genre grew over the 20th century and soared at the turn of the millennium, leading critics grappling for a term, uh, photo novels and photo narratives for Daniel Gorinowski, photo literature for François Soulages, photo text for Harry Blatt, photo fiction and photobiography for Gilles Mora, or yet photobiography, with a play on word with autobiography, as I referred to Annie Arnaud's use of photographs. So before I move to Monin's and Baudou's phototextual projects, I'd like to mention 
euh, Aliette Armel's 2005, Le disparu de Salonique, uh, an autofiction that features photographs taken by the author's grandfather when he served in the Armée d'Orient in 1915-1917, and Nathalie Enig's uh, 2018 Une histoire de France, the story in photographs taken out of the author's paternal and maternal family albums, Ukrainian Jews on one side, and that's the side that you have on the, on the book cover, and Alsatian Protestants um, on the maternal side. And that, can, that book uh, can be read as just another Histoire de France, as Enik, who is a sociologist, uh, mentions herself. As Madeleine Project, they present an Histoire incarnée, and that's Baudou's uh, words, huh? in which you can immerse yourselves. Baudou and Monin stand out um, in all these photo text textual um, output because they went beyond to uh, dimensionality and creative, interactive, immersive works. Both projects share other commonalities than their hybridity and the emotion that their authors felt. They involve an inquiry. Uh, both women were journalists, Monin at the Nouvelle Ops, Baudou at Radio France, and for the web edition of France Info. Both summoned the author's imagination. Both are about anonymous, insignificant people, something that was mentioned this morning, oh, by the way. Both feature uh, pictures discarded or bound for destruction, a fact that is not surprising regarding Madeleine since she died at age uh, 97. She was unmarried, had no children. But a fact that is a little bit more odd regard regarding uh, Mona's people, uh, but that can be explained by the family's disconnectedness. Remember that for uh, Susan Zontag, uh, family pictures bear witness to its connectedness. Huh? Both Monin and Baudou turned the déchets or rebut into traces, into artifacts even, for Baudou. Both writers show that tr uh, traces are fragile and not just because a water leak in the cellar can ruin them or because time made the string of a necklace brittle, but because the people holding the meaning and memory of the trace disappear. However, as Monin and Baudou both show, traces can be revived and one can talk, as Serge Tisseron, of the dynamic de la trace. And a trace can look different um, and take on a different meaning when new light is shed on it. So for example, Baudou's look at the little notebooks was different the second time around because she then knew that they were Lulu's and had learned about his and Madeleine's relationship. On several occasions, Baudou expresses her concern about the fragility of traces, which may partly account for Madeleine project. Où vogueront nos clouds? Que restera-t-il dans nos caves alors qu'aujourd'hui nos photos sont numériques et nos écrits informatiques, she wonders. And later on, as she notices a photograph fading away, comment vont vieillir nos photos numériques? It is partly in order to ground the Im immateriality of photographs and traces that she decided after two seasons to publish her tweets as a book before moving on to season three. A final commonality by publishing in press or online on ordinary people, both Monin and Baudou contributed to the acknowledgement of petit Jean. Both solicit and engage their readers differently. Um, and that's what I'll turn to now, starting with Monin. Um, hold on a second, I lost my page. Yes. Uh, so traditionally, the Jean-Claude uh, Lattès uh, covers feature a photograph. Yet with its multiple pictures, Monin's book cover stood out in the 2015 Rentrée Littéraire. The potential reader's per perplexed interest, the potential reader being me, um, was further, further aroused when they turned the book around and noticed more pictures than that spilled over in the front and back flaps and that a CV was stuck in a sleeve presented as a stamped and crumpled envelope and glued to the inside of the back cover. Okay, so you have a full display uh, here and then the, the little um, envelope um, on the bottom right. Um, before Mona pulled us into her book, the Lattes marketing team did. This spread displays 28 photographs pell-mell, some overlapping others, some cropped, some partly hidden by the frames bearing the book title, its summary, and the barcode. In stark contrast, 
24 photographs are presented in an orderly fashion over 16 pages in the middle section of the book. Interestingly, they only feature all these pictures, feature the 1970s and early 80s, and that's a period of Monin's childhood spent in the same region, Franche-Comté, a coincidence Monin finds amusing. But was it a coincidence that she felt the urge first to every now and then pull a picture out of the envelope that she had tucked away in a drawer, wondering pourquoi me les a-t-on abandonné? Okay, reminder, she bought these, um, these pictures in that envelope. And then uh, to invent these people's story and investigate on them shows that this was no fortuitous event. Dans l'enveloppe, il y a tout de suite deux livres, un roman et une enquête, she writes. Well, the book that emerged out of the envelope is larger than that, since it includes a one-page user manual, the novel, the photo album, the enquête in diary format, followed by a family tree with the people's real and fictional names, the CD's user's guide, and the transcript of 10 of the 12 songs on the CD, okay? Using the girl uh, as our heroine, as the book cover also invites us to do, uh, although she was looking at perfect strangers, Monin looked at the photographs with what Marianne Hirsch called the familial gaze. I quote Hirsch, when I look through my uh, family's albums, I enter a network of looks that dictate affiliative feelings positive or negative feelings of recognition, end quote. The girl's picture is what I call a proto-photograph, the photograph from which the whole story unfolds. Starting with Sandrine or Stéphanie or Laurence, Monin invented a story of abandonment. Since only one side of the family was represented and there didn't seem to be a mother, Monin made Serge, Laurence's father, live a quiet life surrounded by his mother, Mamie Poulet, name being based on the on the picture I put in the in, on the bottom right here. His father Raymond, that would be all uh, you know Raymond, uh, and his aunt Mimi, because these are not real names. The novel starts in 1978, 44 days after Laurence's mother, Michelle, left and followed a co-worker to Argentina. Mona created meaning, that is Laurence waiting for her mother's return, from the phone that appears on, uh, on the other picture at the top of the book cover, and you can see it here, it's on the mantelpiece, right? Um, thus supporting Roland Barthes emphasis on the importance of objects from which the connoted meaning can emerge. What makes Monin's phototextual project particularly noteworthy is that the histoire inventée, as she calls it, presents uncanny parallelisms with the histoire recueillie, also her words. The real story is also one of abandonment, but its main character is not the girl, but the girl's father, Michel, aka Serge in the invented story, who was abandoned four times. The enquête proto-photograph is not the picture of Laurence, but that of Clerval's bell tower, which enabled Monin to identify the village and led her to meeting Michel. After using them to invent a story, Mona used the family pictures to jog Michel's memory and recover the real story. Um, and the, the picture you have on the left here taken, is taken from the middle side of the, the middle section of the book, right, where they're ordered, uh, not pell-mell. Um, so it turned out that the pictures show four, not three generations. And, and cannily, Fictional Laurence, the little girl here in her swimsuit, happened to be named Laurence. Just like in the novel, Suzanne, aka Michelle, did not want to be stuck between the factory and her husband's family and left. And in both stories, people are lost. So the intersections were so numerous that Monin inserted 19 excerpts from her novel into her enquête. That attests that photographs are more than mere certificate of presence. I contend that the hybridity of Monin's book and the intersections between the two stories contribute to immersing the, immersing the readers. What Tara Collington called the space of photographs, which encompasses the choice of the pictures, how they are distributed in the narrative, and the creation of an iconic space alongside a textual space, is what makes us interact with Monin's book. Within the confines of the actual book, 
we are indeed forced to roam from roman to enquête, from picture to text, from front to back cover, from the photographs inside to those on the covers and on the sleeves, to roam every which way in a perpetual movement that will most probably culminate outside of the book, beyond the book limits, in listening to the songs. And maybe we're going to come back to the book to follow the lyrics. The reading experience is limitless because the dialogue between the two and even three media is. As Andrea Oberhuber noted, the reader viewers find themselves in, I quote, a state of mobility of acrobatic equilibrium where they try to enlighten the text with the image and vice versa by frequently going back and forth on both sides of the frontier. A frontier here uh, actually invalidated by Monin, uh, by Monin's inducing that perpetual uh, movement, motion. By having the reader viewer roam between five spaces and by adding an auditory component to her phototextual project, Mona increased the dysrhythmia observed by Dan Daniel Meo in books made of photographs and words. Our interest and curiosity are first piqued by the space or gap between the novel and the enquête, which spurs us to take a closer look at the pictures and read in leaps and bounds forward and backward. But we're not just participants, uh, nor just actors in the actualization of Mona's phototextual project, but we're also creators, creators of the mental representation of the world depicted in the book. Okay, we're familiar with that kind of um, creation by the, by the reader. Most importantly, we're creators of meaning we, because we must see beyond the invest, invented story and the real story and find on our own where the book's real meaning lies, somewhere in the gap, not between the histoire recueillie and histoire inventée, but the gap between Laurence's discarded family photographs and Isabelle Monin's absent ones. Monin says that she has barely any uh, photographs of her own family. In her exercise of Laurence's portrait, Monin invites us to consider the girl as a double of herself. They listened to the same songs and dreamt about the same celebrities. Elle et moi avons vécu le même genre d'enfance. Monin admits in Legend that chercher ta famille, Laurence, hein, c'est comme trouver la mienne. Looking at and for Laurence's family, Monin was in fact looking for her own disparu, her lost ones, as she calls them. Her sister Aude, who tragically died at age 26 and is present in her next book, uh, Mistral Perdu et les événements. I quote, je cherche ce qu'il reste des gens dans l'enveloppe pour que ma soeur ne disparaisse pas. And her deceased newborn Eugène, uh, I quote again les, les gens, Eugène l'aveugle, Laurence's great grandfather, Eugène le prénom de mon éphémère enfant. Laurence's portrait is in fact an allo portrait defined by Hirsch as, I quote, the portrait of the other defined as the other within. Which ex explains why Monin was able to look at Laurence's pictures with a familial gaze. Monin's phototextual project thus enabled us to, um, enabled her, sorry, to prove that each life bears witness to all lives, that behind each person, nous, nous tous, nous total, can be seen. Her project is transpersonal in nature, as is, although differently, Baudou's Madeleine project. So I start uh, my next uh, section with a disclaimer. I am not an adept of Twitter. And I didn't know about Madeleine project from the start uh, with a tweet. I bought the book, uh, I'm a dinosaur, uh, and then I went on the website um, to read season five, because season five is not in the books, I had to do that. And then I went back to the previous seasons online to click on the links that were, of course, not live uh, in the book. In November 2015, Clara Baudou set aside one week to go through Madeleine's stuff. Uh, so by stuff, I mean suitcases full of pictures, letters, and documents, objects, both expected, shoes, books, travel guides, newspapers, less so a tuning fork or outright weird, that's my judgment, uh, like that baby tooth set in a pendant. Uh, but you can find those on Etsy if you're interested for about 40, 50 euros, okay? So from day one, she decided to me plonger pour tenter d'en savoir un peu plus sur elle. 
Starting on November 2nd, 2015, and for five days, she tweeted her findings. Baudou spontaneously, spontaneously chose to tweet rather than write a blog or a novel or whatever, because she was familiar with the medium, which she used at France Info when live reporting, and because she reckoned that le format une image plus une légende collait très bien à l'idée de dévoiler objet par objet. Thus first came the tweets. Um, then Storyfy and Facebook, three months later, the website at the beginning of season two. Then in May 2016, the book of seasons one and two at the aptly named Edition du Sous-Sol, uh, uh, that specialized in journalisme narratif subjectif, and offer, and I'm taking that from their Facebook page, des reportages à lire comme des romans et vice versa. So, This edition du sous-sol was the perfect venue for Baudou's self-defined tweet documentaire out of a cellar. In an interview, Baudou said that she liked the idea of the book insofar as it kept une mémoire d'un projet sur la mémoire and allowed her to figer de l'immatériel, on Twitter, hein, dans du matériel. Uh, and I would just like to, um, to pause very quickly here to... Um, refer back to Sandra's presentation uh, earlier today uh, with a book about collage, right? The collage, the immaterial or almost immaterial being put in a, in a book. Um, in November, 2017, Livre de Poche uh, published seasons one through four in one hefty volume. Uh, yes, hefty volume. I don't know if you can see me, I don't see myself anymore, but okay, hefty. Um, and finally, in June 2019, Madeleine Project exhibit uh, opened. And its success was such that it will be on display uh, at the Boin factory, also in Normandy, uh, this spring. So season one um, takes place in the cellar. In season two, Odu seeks out those who knew Madeleine. Uh, her current and old neighbors, and her godson. Note that these two seasons, uh, one inward, one outward, parallel Monin's process, um, a novel, a novel, then an enquête. Season three starts with Madeleine, uh, her school in Aubervilliers, the amateur movie she made in 1955, but it's really about Lulu, her one true love. Season four refocuses on Madeleine and is a field investigation, Uh, Baudou goes and consults Madeleine's teacher dossier at the, at the archives. Uh, she also goes to Madeleine's last teaching post in the 18th arrondissement and tapes up posters looking for old students. And that's what you have here uh, in the third picture. Uh, she returns to the archives to copy old students' names from ledgers and she starts calling them one by one. And de fil en aiguille, that's what you have at the bottom left um, screenshot. Uh, the fil en aiguille, for it is really like looking for a needle in a, in a haystack, she finds other former students. She fishes the suitcases out of the cellar to comb through them in her apartment, and eventually she goes to Bourges, Madeleine's birthplace, like she found, found out on, um, on Madeleine's diploma. And in Bourges, she confronts the past with the present, uh, taking pictures of pictures or of books in situ. After season four, which she already wasn't sure that she would do, there is only one thread left to pull and feel, uh, the presence of Holland in Madeleine's cellar. Uh, and in season five, uh, where short uh, films of her trip uh, are added, Baudou travels to Holland and meets Madeleine's family friends who complete her portrait. So this short overview shows that Madeleine project with its different platforms, is in, in infinitely more interactive than Monin's Jean dans l'enveloppe and allows for greater dysrhythmia. Where Monin invented a story, Baudou didn't. She anticipates and speculates, uh, for example, about what will be in a, in a tiny leather pouch. And she ins inscribes literarité in her project by creating cliffhangers and suspense, by awakening our curiosity, uh, for example, Um, as she asks us what we imagine there to be on Madeleine's home movie, okay? 1955, as Baudou says herself, women were not doing home movies, men were, were doing that, okay? So first, um, as you see here, 
she has, uh, she's telling us, okay, we're, on est prêt à le visionner, vous êtes d'accord? Okay, so she's postponing the realization of our expectations and desires. She first gives us the sound of the wheel of Madeleine's movie. Et c'est parti. D'abord, voici juste le bruit de la bobine, parce que c'est joli. Ensuite, un petit extrait sonore de Célestin et moi découvrant le film en direct. Okay, and then while this is happening, you know, on, on Twitter, we're pining for the movie. We want to see the movie. Finally, she gives us the movie. Uh, Baudou admits in one of the post faces that follow each season in the book, not online, huh? uh, or on Twitter, that she learned to use the rhythm of tweets plus rapide pour tenter de vous épater, ou plus lente pour créer le suspense. J'ai senti parfois quand vous attendiez la suite. Slowly, like out of the envelope, emerged Monin's Jean, as we and Baudou immerse ourselves, emerges out of the cellar, from the traces she left, un quelqu'un as Boudou put it. And Madeleine truly is a quelqu'un. She is well off, but not too much, educated, but not too much, free-spirited, but not too much, Parisian, but living and working in the less exclusive 17th and 18th arrondissement. She's a middle of the road kind of person whom anyone could relate to. She's novel material with her sad love story with uh, Lulu, the love of her life. Boudou gives us a voice gives him, sorry, a voice in season three with excerpts of his letters to Madeleine. She reels us into this doomed love story. We know as early as, uh, as season one uh, that Lulu died in November 43. We find out the cause of his death only in season three. And I will not spoil it for you. Uh, I'll let you look at the, the picture of his notebook and, uh, and I'll let you figure it out. But we're reading the univocal and truncated epistolary exchange of a doomed relationship, something like a chronicle of a death foretold. Madeleine never married, never had children. She presumably grieved for 30 years since Baudou found Lulu's death announcement in a sealed envelope, uh, talked with Madeleine's god godmother's death announcement in 1972. So 1943, 1972. Neither death announcement is given for us to see. We're reading, as you see on the right-hand side here, a string of pictureless tweets, maybe out of respect for their memory, most probably because Baudou wants to avert, avert any voyeuristic tendency we may have, and because she has activated our empathetic reading, which Monin didn't do, nor meant to do. Monin's pact was with herself and between her and the, and the Jean, whereas Baudou somehow imposes an emotional contract on us, or maybe imposes may not be the right word, but okay, she does have that contract with us. We, we join happily. Um, like her, we do feel emotion, even more so because by season three, uh, when we find out what happened with Lulu, we have connected with Madeleine. We know her and we set on her photographs a familial look. look. So let's see now what contributed to this connection that familiarity, and I'll make four points. First, Madeleine lived in a time and place that we are familiar with, and three kinds of histories coexist. You have history with a capital H, social history, and personal history. Among many historical artifacts, Baudou in, includes, uh, for example, a Paris Match edition of the moon landing, and uh, I've not repro reproduced it here, but Madeleine's mother's voting card from 1945. That was the first time that French women were allowed to vote. Lulu's tiny notebooks, you see three here, um, encompass all three histories. Um, for example, on the first one, you have Visite de la Mère de Roger, signature du traité Germano-Russe, right, on Mercredi, uh, Mercredi 23. So something very personal, La Mère de Roger. We don't know who she is, but the Traité Germano-Russe, that speaks to us. Uh, the second one on the 22nd, uh, Signature de l'Armistice Franco-Allemand à Compiègne. Uh, et en dessous, Cessation des Hostilités, 0h35, heure d'été française, jour de deuil national. And you have these uh, little squiggly things um, because it's the end of the of the hostilities in June 14. Um, so 
uh, Lulu's notebooks encompass all three histories, and so does the, the Madeleine project, which is uh, an histoire incarnée, focusing on a woman akin to, but in stark contrast with Jeanne Calment. Uh, for those who may not know Jeanne Calment, she died in 1997 at age 122. Uh, she was the oldest French woman by then, you know. But she left, as Annie Arnaud noted in La Vie Extérieure, aucun témoignage susceptible d'être transmis de façon universelle. She was, and I still are now speaking, or writing, que du temps pur, biologique. In comparison, in contrast, Madeleine left boxfuls of documents, and she was historical and social time. So that was my first point. Second point, as early as day two, season one, Baudou addressed Madeleine with a familiar tu form, uh, whereas she would have used vous in, uh, in real life. And this is a two, by the way, that we already uh, saw this morning um, uh, presented, maybe Andrea, about the podcasts. Uh, and I don't have uh, the schedule in front of me, but uh, the, the podcast having the two. Huh? Um, and so that's a way of immersing us. The fact is also that we all have a Madeleine in our lives, short of being family, she was a teacher. Third point, in her interacting with Madeleine, Baudou echoes some of our reactions in her tweets. She also addresses us and we feel like confidants. Il faut que je vous raconte ça. That's about finding the home movie. C'est fou, j'avais hâte de vous le dire. At other times, she addresses us and asks us for help and never fails to thank those who did and whom we then want to emulate. We want to be useful to Baudou in her selfless enterprise because as brain research has shown, helping others releases endorphins and feels good. And this is one of four characteristics of ours uh, that Baudou tapped into and catered to. And that's my last point, um, four characteristics. So that was number one. Uh, you also have the fascination that we, we have for photographs, our tendency to lose ourselves in social media and our inclination to binge uh, riding the wave of the reborn interest in the serial format, Baudou presented Madeleine Project in seasons, um, although her fin de la saison 1 was meant jokingly, she, she told me, it was meant as a boutade. Um, so although, well, she presented in, in, in seasons and she doesn't live tweet, but semi-live tweets. Each season after the first one was minutely prepared and orchestrated, Photographs standing at the ready to be live tweeted. At the end of season four, she writes, en guise de générique, uh, it's uh, circled in red here, en guise de générique, je remercie ceux qui m'ont donné les moyens de poursuivre l'enquête. So from the start, um, Melon Project is a projet participatif. On day two, season one, Baudou solicits her followers about an object and credits one for identifying the object of the day before, pretty much like a game show host would. Followers provide answers, theories, images, bake Madeleine's desserts, because she gives us the, the recipes, right? Um, and untangle genealogical threads, identify places, conduct some detective work themselves. As Madeleine, the teacher, was all about transmission, Baudou follows in her footsteps, literally. First at the Aubervilliers School, where Madeleine taught in the late 1940s, and where, incidentally, two CM2 teachers were working on the historical trace. Baudou brought their students artifacts, answered questions, and entrusted them with a mission to find former students of Madeleine's from their school. That's neat. Uh, Participatory in nature, Madeleine project branched out into what Baudou called ramification. These, along with a Twitter 140 character constraint and Baudou's own publication constraints, huh? she typically tweeted for about two hours per day, around midday, four or five days over five seasons. Uh, well, she told me that well, it, was, uh, it was more to create expectation in her followers than anything else. Well, still, it doesn't take away that from the constraining nature. So all these constraints uh, remind us of uh, Ulipo and maybe of Jacques Roubaud's branches and bifurcations. But 
I'm sorry to say that, but who in 2016 would read Rubo's massive meandering books when one can follow a Twitterary project that includes short fragmented texts, photographs, recordings, videos, links, etc. A project that benefits from followers' participation and that resonates in us, as Bodu was repeatedly told by fans. With my land project, Bodu struck a chord because one, she knew her audience. French people's respect and quasi-obsession with patrimoine. Two, she understands human psychology and chose a format that would satisfy our social media binging inclination, but is guilt-free since hers is a noble enterprise. Three, time was right. Baudou rode the wave of publications on ordinary people and of an interest in old stuff as TV programs like Antiques Roadshow and Affaire Conclue show. And four, Madeleine Project immersed us because it filled a void and a need in our lives. Why? Well, maybe in reaction to a technological revolution that propels us too quickly toward an uncertain future and makes us afraid of losing our memory, of losing our humanity to AI, of losing control. And in this respect, in Madeleine Project, Baudou exercises what I th think is excessive control something that Mona didn't do, although she still managed, Mona still managed to protect her Jean's privacy by not releasing their last names. Um, Baudou obviously controls the direction her inquiry will take, as well as the narration and memories, closing the door to what Antonio Anson called lecture commère, gossip reading. She controls and limits the exposure of Madeleine and Lulu's relationship, keeping their première fois to herself and Madeleine, she says, ça, je nous le garde. By hiding her last name and other identifying information, she controls access to ma Madeleine, who then, against all appearances, doesn't belong to the public domain. Finally, in the book, not too differently from Ernaud, she attempts to control the reception of her work with a postface to each of the four seasons where she gives explanations and analyses. And the fact is that these leave us with little room to think critically. A difficulty compounded by a graphic element, a black border that calls to mind, at least to my mind, a death announcement, making Madeleine and everything around and about her sacred, untouchable, somehow immutable. Um, it may be difficult here to see the black border, and that's why I left, you know, it's, I didn't crop the, 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 the picture so that you see with, uh, with the pages and my little sticky notes where that black border is. It's, so it's all around the two pages. Huh? So this black border, reminiscent of death announcements, the semi-live tweet, Vodou's postponing visits or discoveries, and the fear she often expressed that someone may stop her project. Her strong emotional response to Lulu's death. She says that her face is tensed up with uh, sadness. She has la mâchoire serrée, le cœur en vrac. And moments like her disappointment that she didn't see Madeleine s'animer in the home movie are the cracks, the gaps that Baudou couldn't help but leave and from which we can create meaning. We may indeed wonder what loss she, Baudou, was struggling with in this project of recovery and archivization. She herself wonders, est-ce qu'en descendant physiquement dans cette cave, je suis aussi descendu dans une partie de moi-même? Her, je sais que tu publies enfin la saison, saison, euh, season two, va me permettre d'évacuer tout ça, de le donner, de partager, de m'alléger, ne plus être la, soeur, la seule à savoir, makes us wonder what weighs on her that needs to be cleared out. A secret, a loss, a grandparent loss during her childhood that arrested her voice development at the girlish stage. And maybe I'll, uh, I'll play a little bit of, uh, of a video so that you can also hear Bodu's voice um, in the Q&A section. As Monin's Laurence is an allo portrait of Aude, Madeleine seems to be an allo portrait of Bodu, who puts herself in some picture or lets her reflection appear there. Like Madeleine, whom she vaguely looks like, Baudou is single and has no children. After she marche dans ses pas, dans, dans ses pas, on her way to the Aubervilliers school on day one, season three, at the end of season 
before she enters Madeleine's childhood apartment just for the sake of y mettre un pied. And by the end of season five, she has become Madeleine. She ex exchanges letters with her Dutch friends, bakes her biscuit maison, details her own trip to Holland in the same way that Madeleine did hers in 1947. She makes videos much in the same way that Madeleine made a home movie. And in the last video, we no longer know if she's recounting her own trip to Holland or reading Madeleine's travel log. In their article on Madeleine Project, Stéphane Bicchialo and uh, Anne-Cécile Gilbert note that dans la photo documentaire traditionnelle, l'auteur fait tout pour se faire oublier. Whereas Clara construit sa subjectivité dans les clichés, elle fourre ses doigts partout dans le cadre pour bien montrer qu'elle est présente. Bicchialo and Gilbert discuss Madeleine's three portraits and Clara's gradual invasion of Madeleine's photograph. They see Clara's three portraits with a magnifying glass uh, here on the right hand side as a renversement, another word that was used earlier today. And again, I forgot to prepare. Um, renversement, Madeleine's optical device uh, here replacing Clara's smartphone. And they conclude c'est le caractère progressif de cet investissement dans une vie qui est très beau dans cette relation et mise en œuvre par l'autrice afin d'investir. Uh, son lecteur. And we are indeed fully invested in the project, which brings me to my last point. Since we binge read the tweets like Baudou binge read Lulu's letters, that's the word she uses, hein? um, c'est du uh, Lulu, Lulu binge, ou binge Lulu. Do the tweets like his letters represent absence, au pluriel? Why do we immerse ourselves in such projects if not to combler les vies? fill some voids, find some lost ones, and find ourselves and make our lives matter? One last hypothesis I'd like to offer is that maybe these hybrid projects' immersive potential can be found in our pre-reading and even pre-linguistic past when we were read picture books in a safe and warm environment. So to recap, using Mona and Baudou, Adventure that the immersive potential of literature and hybrid media lies in the characters, how the medium is utilized. Uh, even a medium with a low interaction index can be interactive. Think of the You're the Hero books, ce uh, livre dont vous êtes le héros. Uh, the narration with cliffhangers, mysteries, etc. Seriality, uh, at least in uh, Baudou's case. Uh, the reader's contribution to meaning by providing information with Baudou, by having to piece elements together uh, with Mona or when we read the Nouveau Roman. The use of images that makes us roam as with Mona or that summon a pre-linguistic stage, at least in our book-focused societies. Um, and it's pleasurable, productive and transformative capacity as the uh, organizers of this symposium had put in their call for papers. Beside a very pleasurable immersive experience, Monin's and Baudou's projects undoubtedly offer a productive one. Uh, I can tell you that some tweets sent me Googling for more information. The authors were transformed by this experience. After Les Gens, Monin openly wrote about her sister in uh, Mistral Perdu ou Les Événements. After season five, Baudou moved out of her apartment and started filming the, the, filming the living in her short film, In Place au Soleil. Uh, that's what you have at the bottom in the middle uh, with the feet peeping out uh, that took place, that was shot during the, the, the lockdown in Brussels. With Madeleine, Baudou overcame her fears and dared. As for us, only we can say what transformation these projects will spur, spur us towards. Thank you. Uh, and sorry if I lost myself again in Madeleine project during this talk. And I'll actually, I have um, Beth, if that's okay with you, uh, yeah. since I'm still sharing my screen, could I maybe have one minute to listen to uh, Bodu's? I think that's uh, a great idea. Yeah, okay. that's great. So let me remember. <laughs> uh, okay. So we're in season five. And I want to go. You can hear it? 
can you hear her? I think you need to, um, uh, I think you're just showing one screen. I think you need to change the screen that you're looking at. So maybe unshare and then share again and make sure you click the button yeah. that says um, share sound. Easy. Share. Okay. And how would I share the sound? Uh, just give it a go, see if it's um okay. Can you hear that? No, so um unshare and then when you go to choose the screen that you want to share, there's a little um there should be a little box to tick at the bottom. So um if you unshare and then you go no. to share again when you're choosing the different screens. Yes, uh I don't little share. box. So I want to be here. Oh, share sound. Here we are. Oh, thank you. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, it always trips me out. I start teaching yeah. next week, so I have plenty of time to get to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let me just go back for it. Here. Yvonne connaît tout le monde dans le village, donc c'est facile. You can hear it, right? Yes, okay. Samedi 30 août, 16h. Visite détaillée du moulin à eau voisin. J'ai l'impression d'être en week-end chez une amie. Yeah. 15 août, 7h, levé. 8h, petit déjeuner. Visite des serres. Okay, so that was just to, to give you an idea of how she was um, actually sharing, you know, giving the, at what time she gets up, etc. And here, um, if you see on this slide, right, on the left-hand side, you have uh, the, the record that uh, Madeleine made of her visit to Rotterdam, etc. with a 18 août, levé et petit déjeuner, matinée à la maison, etc. So you have um, some parallelism here. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Here we are. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, that was a absolutely exemplary engagement um, with the symposium topic, but also a very enriching uh, piece of work on its own. Um, I really, really enjoyed um, um, listening to that. And um, I'm going to open up the floor for questions just because I'm genuinely struggling to, to find which question I want to start with myself. There's so many points to pick up on. Um, so if anyone has any interventions, you can write it in the, the chat and I can repeat it or you can put your hand up. Um, love to hear your questions, comments. Okay, I might kick us off while everyone's thinking. Um, so I... Um, I think transpersonality is a really interesting. Oh no, I'll start with Dawn. Sorry. <laughs> Did you want to go ahead? I can. I didn't mean to cut you off. It just took me a while. No, to... no, no, you can. Um, I just wanted to sort of share something that I that I put in the chat, um, Michelle, when you were talking about when you showed the the pages with the black screen with the black border around them. The thing that I immediately thought of was was the different images in the in a strip of film um where there's and or on a contact sheet of photographs where they're and what i was thinking of in in, ter, in those terms was it's, it's both it's 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 something that's continuous right either the either a strip of film or even a contact strip that shows shows many many photographs but it's also discontinuous because each one is separate so anyways, that's just what that particular image made me think of when you showed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll, I'll pick up there. Just um, I was really interested when you um, showed that that shot and you talk uh, that shot of the page and how it kind of looks like a death announcement. And then you're also talking earlier about um, how this is kind of a chronicle of a death foretold. Um, I'm really, um, personally, I'm really interested in photographs and, and the symbolism surrounding them in terms of death and how they're often used to kind of um, 
they're talking about, you talk about foreseeing death. And I think these photographs in particular, death and life are kind of right beside one another, um, especially because they're kind of being activated and, and the people that we know are already dead, but they're being brought to life, um, especially through things like an exhibition and tweeting. Um, as you say, Boudou is very, very, um, kind of amplifies the immersive potential of things like this. Um, I'm wondering, did you have anything to say about, um, I guess, uh, photographs and, and how the medium communicates um, something about death or it symbolizes death, but also symbolizes things like memory as an, an associated notion. Um, I think you, you mentioned this in, in your concluding comments, how the medium is utilized. Um, it really creates um, kind of a, a more immersive, immersive nature um, through, the, through the symbolism surrounding the media. Did you have anything to, to add to that or agree or disagree with? No, I totally agree. Of course, uh, we are fascinated by photographs there, and it's been shown, you know, uh, that we aussi plonge, right? We dive in, and something, uh, something attracts us sometimes, or you know, either we have a, a, a I would say, a, a, an interest that is quite common, you know, like that was Bath Studium, right? So we are interested, okay, but not more than that, and some really talk to us, you know, some really uh, pierce us, that's the, he's a punctum. And um, so, for example, I'm thinking back, I don't remember with the, the Madeleine project, I was thinking about that. Uh, I don't know if it's because there were, there are so many, so many pictures and I have the book, I, you know, I started working from the, from the book, not from the tweets. Um, that you may be, as a the reader, may be overwhelmed by all these um, all these photographs. Um, so I was thinking, well, did any of them just, you know, spoke to me more or attracted me more? And I think that there are very few. And some of them I showed. It's when you see Clara Baudou's reflection, like with the wheel, for example, mm -hmm. and also her thumb. Because what's interesting, I think, about her thumb is that okay, it's always there, but you have to hold the, 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 the picture to, to take another picture. But her thumb sometimes, elle, elle ronge ses ongles. I'm not sure how to say that in English. So mm -hmm. the, that, 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 that's part of the, of the punctum. Um, with Mona, what's interesting with Mona also that she has, um, so she started with that little girl, right? We had, uh, that's what's interesting for her. We would have a very different genre dans l'enveloppe had she chosen the, the father, um, Serge or Michel, right? That we see, um, no, uh, oops, that we see here at the, at the bottom. Um, the girl, choosing the girl and her gaze outside of the, of the, of the frame, that's the punctum here. And of course, the whole story is not what you see, but it's somewhere else. We're, we're, invited to look for meaning outside of the frame, outside of the frame of the book, outside of the frame of the of the picture itself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, no, that's good. Kind of yeah. No, no, yeah, I think I think that's um that's that's really um why this topic is so compelling because it there's really so much to look at. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. It makes it much more immersive. Um, but just on the studium punctum, um, I absolutely agree with everything you're saying there in terms of the punctum being very present. Um, and it's also there in an explicit sense. Um, because Oh, just a quick, like I'm sure everyone knows, but the punctum is um, kind of a detail that um, captures an individual and that establishes a direct emotional connection um, with one person, whereas the studium is kind of this... Uh, refers to a more general interest in the photograph where everyone can kind of agree that there's this universal thing that's compelling about the photograph. Um, and I think absolutely the, the punctum is there in an explicit sense through that, um, that kind of blurring of identities that, ha that happens in both works where the author says that, that she feels like that she finds herself in the photograph and um, or in all of the photographs and and um, connects with with the people there um, but I wonder um, at the end of the day the studium is there as well absolutely in the sense that that's why the tweets and the project and the exhibition and everything happened with will do at the very least um, and I, I'm not sure about how that would happen with Mona um, did, do you have any thoughts on on 
on how this on how these photographs shift between kind of having this personal interest and also this broad universal following, especially with Baudou and maybe or maybe yeah. not. I think um, I think you have it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you have it with Baudou. I don't think that you have it with Mona. Uh, I mean, there is a transpersonal with, with Mona, but it's not as universal, let's say, or collective as a uh, Madeleine project is, okay? But we're tapping into something, in many things that are very important for the French, you know, the, the Le Patrimoine, uh, the Second World War, um, the first day Madeleine, um, on my last uh, slide, I have some personal photographs, right? I, my aunt was Madeleine, my grandmother was Madeleine. Uh, mm -hmm. So Mona's project was, I think, uh, was, um, well, I don't know, I'm thinking as, uh, as I go, and I, I'm, I don't think that Baudou realized from the very, she didn't realize when she started that she would have that many followers, okay? She started having followers from day one, okay? Uh, I'm not sure that she, she knew what the, um, the impact that uh, the Madeleine project would have, okay? Um, but it does because you have because of these different histories, I, I believe, and because because she because of the the target audience, I would be interesting. For example, it would be interesting to me at least to know whether how it was received, how it was perceived in the United States, where patrimony and history are viewed very differently. For example, Mona didn't have that. Didn't mean that from the very from the beginning. You know, it's just she got interested in Laurence, for example, and not in, in Serge because she was looking for Aude because she put herself, she saw herself in that girl. And probably that what brought me, um, you know, I remember being in the, in the bookstore and looking at that book and probably what drew me into it because it's also my time period. I'm not sure that if she had taken Michelle, I would have been interested because I was already working on phototextuality, but probably not as much invested as I as I became. Uh, so it's Monin's project is transpersonal, but not as collective as universal or not universal collective, let's say, as mm -hmm. uh, as um, the Madeleine project is, and that's why I don't think that an exhibit would be. Um, what's what would be the point? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe it's rude to say it that way for uh, Mona while it's really working wonderfully for Baudou. Um, it was so successful that uh, it was supposed to be only six months. It was, um, it lasted six, six, six additional months and then the pandemic hit, so three more months. And now that it's gonna be in a different place for three months, uh, March to May in 2022. Some, I got in touch with uh, the, the young man that that runs it, uh, that ran it in the first time around, and he says that some people came to the museum just to see the Madeleine project, and one couple actually drove more than four hours. It's not much by American standards, but by French standards, it's a lot, just to see it. So it definitely yeah. has an appeal, it triggers something in people. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, and I think that this is a question that endures kind of well beyond Bart's and to the, the um, contemporary um, era for all the reasons that you outline. Um, I think we 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 have time, but I just I'm really curious to ask one more question. Um, and if anyone else wants to um, intervene, I've spoken to the organizers, and they're okay with the five minute um, five minutes extra for questions if that suits you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. um, and and just just on that contrast between um, uh, Mona and Baudou. Um, I'm thinking about um, well, you just you discussed how Baudu really um, succeeds a little bit more in activating uh, an empathetic reading um, uh, to a much greater extent than Mona, uh, and I'm just I it just um, that aspect of your talk made me think about the fact that that I think that she strives for that, but just in a different way. So creating stories around photographs, I wonder whether that is the way of um, as we kind of um, May or may not agree with, but fiction can can be very um, empathetic. Uh, can can activate empathy um, in itself. And I'm just wondering what you thought about that. Whether she she does 
maybe she succeeds not so much, but she does still strive for that kind of um, activating of empathy on the part of the reader um, through um, through the way that she she juxtaposes photographs and 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 stories. Um, you may or may not agree with that, but it's just something to think about. I think that theoretically you're right, but I don't feel it with Mona. I don't think mm -hmm. that she tries to have that. Uh, she doesn't offer us that um, that pact, that that contract at all. So no, it's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, uh, that's my reading. So somebody else may have a, a different uh, a different reading on it, but. Um, and that's why maybe more than than Boudou, it was really to address some personal issues. And it's no surprise then then the next book is uh, uh, Les, uh, Mistral Perdu ou Les Événements about her sister. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, it does, does anyone have any other questions before we we close or any other comments? Or Michelle, is there anything else you wanted to you wanted to cover? Okay. Literally, Beth, you sent me some, uh, you had sent me a, a few things and I like one, well, I like all your comments, but there is one that resonated even more when you mentioned the uh, um, vrac, because uh, Boudou says, elle a le coeur en vrac, and you're, you're think, you also mentioned, well, you know, les, les, les photos chez uh, Monin, they are given pêle-mêle, right? Donc, you have the, the vrac, um, 250 pictures and you have a full cellar full of stuff. How do you deal with the vrac, with the chaos? Um, yeah. And that's, I think, a, a very interesting uh, point also here that um, I think what's maybe appealing in these texts also is that um, we, we're tapping into something profoundly human, you know, human traits like, okay, we have chaos. What do we do when we have chaos we try to see patterns right we try to restore some kind of order an order that makes sense uh, for us and that's what these two projects are about we are guided you know we follow some um, some uh, some thread uh, if you want we are free of course to roam but we still have just in case you know that we go we stray too far off and we get scared because it's the unknown uh, or we're going to waste maybe too much time, then we can always go back to the, the chemin balisé in a way, you know, to what, what was cleared uh, for us. So you have, I think, also the idea of, of the garde-fou, that you feel safe uh, with what they've, what they've done, you know, um, that you don't have that foison that could be threatening to us. Yeah. I don't know, maybe I'm going way off track here. No, that's no, that's really interesting. I was I wasn't sure whether or not to bring up that question. I just um I felt like um we should, yeah, we could finish on time. But I, I um that's really interesting your your kind of response to that. And I think especially um what's really interesting about these works is um you, you have this kind of aesthetic of um, en vrac and, and accumulating stuff and archive and piles and then they do this sorting process, um, which is kind of reflective of as you say, like life in general, um, which is really hard to kind of bring order to life, um, to, to a life and to experiences and to people. And I think what's really interesting about these works is they don't resolve that fully. I think they don't, they, they attempt to create an order and to put things in place, but they really let it be in its chaos nonetheless. And that's almost um, an even more successful way of portraying people and their lives and the complexity right. of that and the contradictions and the piling up of experiences, especially with the, the cover that you showed, the, um, yeah. all the these piles that just they, um, they can't really be put into order. Um, so they do that to an extent, but they also let the chaos kind of um, be free. Because that's what life is, right? It's controlled chaos. Uh, and I wanted to share also something that um, Baudou uh, told me because so the, 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 the five seasons you know, she had season one uh, that was more spontaneous than the, than the next, than the other two. Uh, but when I asked her about, you know, the timing that I thought, oh my God, it's always at the same time. 
And uh, she said that by the fifth day, you know, she, by that Friday, she had to stop uh, tweeting and everything because uh, so she, she wrote to me, uh, je me sentais tellement dépassée par tout ça qu'il fallait de toute façon que j'arrête et réfléchisse. Donc, j'ai clôturé en disant fin de la saison 1, presque comme une boutade. And then afterwards, she basically uh, did, decided to follow the same pattern, okay, because those that had followed her would probably follow her again, right? So, but she took the time, she was not sure where the, the, the threads, the leads, uh, would go, um, and if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read her, her text, uh, her mail. Je suis restée en mode « donner un rendez-vous aux internautes que je fixais uniquement quand je savais que tout était prêt et que j'avais assez de matière, de choses à partager. Um, » Donc, she worked on the enquête, she did everything, and you basically have three stages where she does the inquiry, she harvests, as she says, elements, hein, je récolte, and then you have the uh, writing stage, the organizing stage, and then showtime over five days. And she really sees it, sees it as a performative act. And performance is something that also came up in the, in the previous uh, um, talks uh, this morning. Um, so I wanted to also to, um, to, to, to add that and the fact that she's creating attempt mm -hmm. in, the, in the followers, because when we're dealing with if immersivity, so she understands her medium very well. And she understands people, psychology uh, of people very mm -hmm. well too. Yeah, I think I think um, Baudou's project in particular is quite remarkable for that reason. Just the link that she creates with um, with her um, followers um, is really, really, yeah, quite amazing. And it also could make us think about the the difference of the difference between physical material archives or analog archives and then digital archives and, and and you actually brought up a quote that she says like she has she has no idea what's going to become of her comment vont veillir um nos traces numériques or no je sais, i don't know what she says i can't quite remember but i think that's a really interesting distinction there too maybe they will not have the the chance to get old because i don't know about you but i take a lot of these pictures and I look at them and then I forget about them they are too much. When you have too much, then they're lost more than the ones, the physical ones, the analog that are there and that clutter your house. You have to be forced to deal with them. Whereas yes. the, um, yes, the other the, one, you just out, out, out of mind, out of sight, out of, out mind. of mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Okay, but thank you so much, Michelle, for that really wonderful paper. Um, and thanks so much to everyone for your attendance. Um, I'll give you one last round of applause. Um, thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you all tomorrow, hopefully, um, for uh, day two. Um, and we'll open with a keynote by Alexand uh, Alexandra Kerman. Um, and that'll be at 8 a.m. UK time, 7 p.m. in um, Australia. And I think the US folks might have a little bit more difficulty um, attending, um, but the recordings will be made available. Um, so um, for especially Michelle, that was really, really wonderful, genuinely great. <laughs>